All right, welcome everybody. It's Sunday afternoon. It's two o'clock um, here in sunny Santa Fe. I'm looking out the window in front of me at the beautiful mountains, and uh, we're here at Santa Fe Skies RV Park, which um, is the nation's only solar-powered RV park. They have 810 sun modules um, with a uh, $1.2 million system, and don't be jealous, depending on where you are, but they're getting paid 14 cents a kilowatt hour for what they produce here. So uh, this system is pretty neat, and um, all the RVs that are parked here are running off solar, which is great. So we are coming to you powered by solar right now, actually. Um, so my name is Kathy Redson. I haven't done any of the study sessions yet, um, but we are uh, trying to use these weekends, you know, prior to the uh, exam. I know a lot of you are preparing, and even though these sessions are relatively informal, um, as we kind of work through these problems together and provide some answers. Um, kind of came as a, a brainchild of Richard yesterday when he sat down to make some PowerPoints on some of the problems that were out there and thought, well, you know, instead of me just sitting here on my own making these PowerPoints, what if uh, I log in, set up a session, and let the uh, you know, participants um, go through it with me? And so it would be a little bit slower pace as I build these solutions and give people a chance to kind of, you know, find out uh, the methodology of, of kind of working through some of these problems and um, how you approach it. And, you know, in most cases, there's more than one way to approach these things as long as you're utilizing all the correct uh, principles. So uh, it, with the content domain number three that's coming up tomorrow night, we have Janet Hughes from Ontility. And uh, Janet's been in the solar business for over 30 years. Uh, she's been a master electrician for 18 years. She is one of the prominent solar installers in Austin. Uh, she had a company there called Janet's Electric, and then she uh, global uh, solar global PV design was a company she had for a while. Then she started Advan, which was a training company back in 2009, which ultimately merged with Ontility. So she's got a lot of experience in um, installing systems has uh, done things from the smallest residential, you know, off-grid, direct TV systems, all the way up to large uh, um, megawatt design. I was trying to call in, and I couldn't figure it out at first, but I just had to hit line one, so I'm good. <laughs> all right, you in? Everybody in? I'm in. Okay. So anyway, Janet's going to be great, and she's got a lot of experience. And so what we try to do ahead of these uh, webinar sessions is provide uh, some – Guidance on some of the problems ahead of time, so you're working in the material, in the JTA, in the textbooks that you have, the Dunlop book, the Mike Holt book, the code book, and getting familiar uh, with where things are so that as your presentation comes on, uh, you can actually make that more interesting. Uh, sometimes pre-learning things when you take courses is actually more beneficial than waiting for the teacher to present it and then catching up after the fact. Um, because that way when you walk in for the lecture, you're, you're actually familiar with the concepts that are going to be covered, and things make more sense. And you have the opportunity to ask questions uh, or get clarification on things that before this presentation were unclear to you. And so in addition to getting material, you're getting guidance and, and filling in the gaps at the same time. So um, one of the most you are issued a code book when you take the NABSEP exam. That's one thing they give you. They sign that out. You're not allowed to write in it. You're not allowed to bend any of the pages. You're not allowed to do anything like that while you're taking the test. Uh, but you can, um, you know, so, so knowing where things are, uh, knowing how things are cross-referenced, understanding how the, the, the NEC code book is arranged is a crucial part of being ready for the test. Uh, when you're in the test, it's four hours, and it's a constant sound of pages shuffling. It's almost distracting in a way because everybody's flipping back and forth through the code book. You know, when you get 100 people in a room doing that, uh, it actually gets loud. So, uh, they, you know, you need, to, you need to know where things are. And as you get closer to the end, maybe the last hour, you see people starting to sweat and start flipping the pages madly, um, <laughs> looking for things, and you wish you know what's running through their head. That is, if they had spent more time understanding, you know, the code book, um, understanding where things were, understanding what's in the book and what's not in the book, what they could, should bother looking up or trying to find or not, 
um, they'd be certainly using their time more wisely. On the Friday before the exam, we're going to have another WebEx session going over some test-taking strategies. And um, so, you know, we'll talk about some of the things you can do in, in staying organized throughout the exam and making sure you answer all the questions and utilizing your study uh, and scratch paper properly and the code book properly. But uh, what I want to do today is if you haven't cracked the code book, if you haven't started really understanding how to use it, you've only looked at Article 690, you've looked at some of the tables in the textbooks that are referenced and you understand those like 690.7 or, um, you know, the voltage drop, which uh, Richard did yesterday and some of the other things. Um, believe it or not, uh, there's a lot more in there and it's a lot easier to use than you may think. So uh, what I want to do is just, um, I have an electronic version of the book. So if you bear with me, there's going to be time during this presentation where we slow down a little bit. I am actually running off of Richard's computer. Mine is archaic and uh, won't log on on the Ethernet connection. So if I stumble a bit, bear with me. But uh, I'm going to jump over real quick to the code book. And show you what okay. There we go. This is an electronic version of the NET code book that you can get when you um, through the Oregon uh, the website for the, the electrical code in Oregon. And we'll move this over a little bit so we can get back to the beginning. Actually I'll just type in page one over here. Okay, so uh, this is an electronic version of it, which is great. Uh, when you can use those, they're, they're searchable. So you can come up here and I can type, you know, the word uh, conductor, and it'll go and actually navigate every occurrence of the word conductor. I can navigate the word uh, PV source circuit, and it'll take me right to the definitions of that. So searching every page in there right now, but it'll take you to the first occurrence of that word. Probably will be on the first definition page in Article 690. But if you haven't got this, you can search for it online or you can download it, I believe, on our website through one of the newsletters. And uh, that way you can start, you know, understanding and, and getting through the code book quickly. You obviously won't have an electronic version during the exam, but at least um, no matches. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Anyway, so... Uh, what we're going to do first is um, go through some of the uh, – so it starts out with a table of contents. And, by the way, every page in the NEC code book begins with article – with the number 70. And that's because um, that within the National Fire Protection Association, the NEC, the National Electric Code, is their um, code 70. There are other codes that they have that are part of the NFPA, but this is the one that deals with electric. So um, – Everything in the NEC code book is part of Code 70, uh, and things we're dealing with elect electrical safety, like 70E, which is a safety manual that you should know, um, all pertain back to electrical, which is under the purvey of the National um, whoops, uh, Fire Protection Association. So some things you can find in the table of contents, and you should take some time and review it. This gives you the actual headings for the sections within the code book. Um, for example, uh, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So if you look at it, um, first of all, there are articles within the code book. There are uh, articles are uh, part of the way it's organized, and um, there's article. Okay, so the formal definition of NEC contains about 140 articles, each of which covers a specific subject. So the articles begin like Article 90, Article 100, Article 110, I'm sorry, Article 90, uh, Article 110. These are all articles. Within them, there are sections and tables. Some people, um, within the articles are parts, which are the Roman numerals, one, two, and as you see in Article 110 down here, um, so, so this is the article number. Uh, 
I'm grabbing highlights. Where's the big kitty at? Oh my god, no. On Acrobat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's on the box too. I was trying to get the select box. <laughs> anyway, um, it's on the screen. Is that the reason? Nope. That's there. Okay. There we go. All right. I had clicked it at the bottom, but not there. So Article 90 is one, Article 100, Article 110. And then these Roman numerals here pertain to the part numbers. Okay, so those are, that's how it's organized. Um, so, for example, in Article 110, um, you see how it says uh, Article Part 1 is general, Part 2 deals with 600 volts or less, Part 3 is 600 volts or more. And so, in the section numbers, when you refer to the codes, it doesn't give you the part, but you've got to make sure when you look through the code book that you're in the right part for the situation that you're in. And the Mike Holtbook is a good example of that. Um, for example, uh, dealing with um, the number of working clearances. In part two, in article 110, um, for under 60, 600 volts, and we can go right to that page um, that would be on page. Let me jump to it. Okay, I'm just going to use the code book. That would be on page 37. So here we are in the code book. It shows the highlighted ones. As I get into Article 110, I'm Probably went too quickly here, but it shows where I'm at. It begins part two, which deals with under 600 volts nominal. Let's try to search it. So there it takes me to 110.26. With the 110.16, and there it is, right there. So, right here is where it begins with part two. So, if you don't catch that as you're going through the code section um, or the article, you uh, everything that follows that Roman numeral two is going to deal with. 600 volts or less nominal system, okay? So within that part, as you move ahead, you'll notice that um, all these things here in terms of working space have to do with article, with systems that are 600 volts or less. So here's that table, um, 110.26A1, which is, pertains to one of the problem sets that we have here today. And uh, so if the systems are less than 150 volts, like it says here, okay, then if it's condition one, where there's only live parts on one side of the working space, okay, uh, and there are no live or grounded parts on the other side, then you have a maximum, you have a distance for work clearance from the live parts okay, um, to any other, the distance behind you of mandatory three feet. Condition two says if there's live parts on one side of the space and a concrete brick wall uh, on the other, and uh, exposed live parts on one side and grounded parts on the other side, but not necessarily live parts, then you would have condition two, which is also three feet. And if you're still in 150 volts and you get to where there's exposed live parts on both sides, that's when you would need you know, three feet. So when you get greater than 150 volts, that you've got to be into this 
four foot range or three foot six range, depending on whether you're in a room where on both sides of the wall, on, in front of and behind you, you've got either grounded parts or live parts, you know, in the same room. Uh, in the Mike Holt book, there's a great illustration of that on, um, find the page. Okay. Shows that on the top of page um, 33 in the book. You'll turn to that page and it gives you the actual three foot, three and a half foot, four feet, depending on um, what your conditions are in terms of the amount of voltage in that space. So that's what pertains to systems that are in basic installations where you're operating under 600 volts. If you move ahead in the code book, to uh, down the page a bit, or down the book a bit, where Roman numeral three begins. That's part three, dealing with, as you see right here, okay, boom. Oops, wrong, wrong one. <laughs> Roman numeral three. I keep going, I'm going to come back to that one. That was also one of your questions. Moving down, moving down. Somewhere in here, in the next page. There we go. So starting at 11, one, Article 110.30, that's where it's now um, dealing with systems over 600 volts. So if you're just flipping through the code book and you're looking for chart, and if you keep going in this uh, segment, you'll see where um, there's another table. It says minimum distance from the fence, and then on down. You might uh, end up looking at the distance in here. It's minimum distance to live parts. If you're not sure what, if you don't pay attention to what section you're in within Article 110. You're, you're actually using, you know, an answer. One of the selections could be, you know, 10 feet. And you're looking it up quickly and you find yourself in here, minimum distance from the fence to live parts. You end up selecting the wrong answer because you're in the wrong section of this article. So uh, there's articles, there's parts, there's sections, and then there are subsections and sub subsections. One other interesting thing that's kind of tricky, when I first started using the code book, if you look at Article 110.30, for example. That's 110.30. And if you look back to the beginning of this article, 110.5, okay, which could be interpreted as 110.50 in your mind. Um, right here, uh, this 110.5 comes before Article 110.30. So they don't put it as a decimal 110.05 in the code in the sections. So uh, just know that when you're trying to look up a um, an article or a subsection in the code book. Um, you know, when it says 0.5 or a single digit like this, um, that really should say, you know, if, we were, if it was really easy to follow, 110.05 um, in the way you need to think about it, okay? And that way, of course, it would be before 110.30. So finding things you're looking for, um, all, it, 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 these are just a few gotchas that can slow you down and make you flip into the wrong section of the code book or unable to find something when you see that it's either referred somewhere else in another code or subsection and uh, then you're supposed to try to go and find it and you're looking at the numbers on the pages and you're not, you're not finding what you need, okay? All right. Um, so another uh, thing to bear in mind I'm going to go back to the beginning a little bit. And then once I get through just a basic introduction here, because some people are very familiar with this, and for those of you that I'm boring to tears, I apologize. Um, but for those of you that really haven't spent much time here, um, 
it's important that everybody understand how to use this book. Okay. So there's articles, parts, there's sections, there's subsections, and um, what is where. So one thing I, I think is interesting, and if you haven't already done so, is a lot of people, uh, you know, the, make mistakes in doing electrical work um, by not, or, or think that the code book is difficult to read because they don't actually take the time to read through Article 90, which comes before the actual article. And I'm trying to back up where that begins. Um, but in Article 90, there's a lot of definitions. And I do remember questions on the test that I thought I was supposed to have known because uh, I didn't study Article 90. I thought it really all began with the definitions in Article uh, 100. And so there were a few things that came up that um, I made that I didn't, didn't know I had the answer to right in front of me had I looked up certain things in Article 90. So I'm going to give you a heads up on an area that uh, may come up. All right. Sorry, I'm my electronic version here. I got ahead of myself and I got behind myself. Okay. So uh, it tells you about the, the purpose of the code. It doesn't. It's not the law. Uh, authorities having jurisdiction have to adopt the code. Um, I learned last year in my travels around the seventh district for the JATC that there are uh, jurisdictions in New Mexico and in other parts of the country that are still operating under the 1984 edition of the NEC. I was on the phone with someone from SMA and arguing because in their Sunday Boy 700. There's not room for a separate uh, grounding electrode conductor, as well as the grounding conductor coming from the, AC, uh, the DC disconnect, as well as the one going out to the inverter. There's only lugs inside the Sunny Boy 700 for two connections, and you have three. And I was trying to figure out how we were going to do that um, and needed to contact them to see if they minded if I had made an attachment penetrating the back of the unit into the actual encasement. And, of course, they said that would void the warranty. But um, I said, you know, in, in the 2011 code, uh, you don't have to have a separate grounding electrode conductor coming out of the inverter. So the Sunny Boy 700 is code compliant with the two uh, connections in the, in the grounding lug that it has the way the 2011 code is. But it's not code compliant for a 2008 code without adding a Polaris I mean, I'm sorry, without adding a separate um, bonded uh, um, uh, grounding um, uh, lug that has the ability for you to, to uh, attach more than um, two attachments. So he was telling me, well, what I needed to do was tell the authority having jurisdiction that they needed to move to the 2011 code because it's the law. This is an SMA tech support guy. I said, I don't know where you're from, but... The AHJs, they decide when they're going to move. And some move as soon as the code is announced and start training their linemen and their inspectors and their people to operate to that code level. Um, others wait. Uh, I know that the state of Louisiana, up until recently, um, I think they actually skipped the whole 2008 version of the NEC and went from 2005 right to 2011. So when you're doing work, uh, and when you're, you're trying to understand what you need, which code you need to adhere to, it is the authority having jurisdictions um, right, if you will, to uh, decide whether or not to ad adopt these recommendations, you know, or not. And then even when they decide to adopt a particular code version, they can actually elect not to adopt certain portions of it. So when you're doing work outside of different areas, you've got to, you know, it's really important that you understand it. So there were questions that, you know, um, dealt with it. And uh, in the back of Section 90, it talks about this, and there's also a pretty good discussion in the Mike Holt book. Uh, and I came across something last night, and one of the problems we'll get to in a little bit, that talked about how, you know, there are certain fine print notes or informational notes or exceptions that come out in different art, um, subsections of the code that uh, – some, you know, things are allowed with special permission. And uh, it was a question I remember on the test that I took that said, um, whose, 
who, who would be the authority granting the permission to do something that appeared in the code book um, with a note as some sort of special permission? And when it says that, if you don't know what that means, that doesn't mean the customer gives you that permission or the supervisor or the journeyman or, um, you know, the, the, the building codes or the fire marshal. It, it really is, you know, the, the utility or the authority having jurisdiction from a code perspective that would either have to allow or not allow you to do something according to that special permission. So the multiple choice answers were, um, Who's who would be the person to grant the you know the, the permission um, under this article to do X Y Z? And when you looked it up, you know the correct answer was um, the uh, electrical utility, you know, authority having jurisdiction, not the customer, you know, not the installer, not the not the, the supervisor or the uh, foreman. And um, you know where to get guidance on that is actually in Article 90. But then again, you know, that can be uh, something you got to read through. And there's a really good section in the beginning of, the, of all the Mike Holt books that discuss some of these parameters um, of Article 90 and whose permission it is and, and what it means to have permission, what it means to have something that's listed, what it means to um, shall not, shall, must not, must, um, you know, all those things. So please take some time to look over that so that you don't get stumped. And if you need guidance during the exam, remember that there's information about that in Article 90, which under normal circumstances, you might not even have a, you know, the occasion to read. So the code book is, this is where it talks about enforcement. And here's exactly what I'm talking about there, okay? So um, let me shift this over a bit and see where it actually describes the situation I just talked about here in um, Article 90. This was on the exam. And so here it is. It says, request for special permission may be made in writing to the authority having jurisdiction. Um, special permission must be granted in writing uh, and shall be obtained prior to the start of the electrical installation. So, uh, so just read through this article, um, section 90.4, and there was the answer to that question, okay? Before I jump off this page, what I was just about to get into is this part over here on the left, how the actual code book is organized. Okay. And it's divided into the introduction in nine chapters. Chapters one through four apply generally, and chapters five, six, and seven apply to specific occupancies, special equipment, or other special conditions. A lot of chapters apply, supplement, or modify the general rule. So, Things like wire sizing, grounding, overcurrent protection, um, definitions, general principles are all going to be covered in chapters one through four. That's why to be able to do, you know, this and to pass the exam, you have to be able to know a lot more than just Article 690. To read this, what that means is Article 6, okay, or Chapter 6, which contains Article 690, has special conditions and pertaining to installations like solar. So that's where chapters one through four always apply. But when you're reading through Article 690, it'll say, you know, the grounding must be done in, um, in compliance with Article 250.122, with the following exception. And so the reason Article um, Chapter or Article 690 was written is so that. Um, you're going to see things in there that might override under special conditions pertaining to PV systems, things that would normally be done a certain way as defined somewhere in chapters one through four. Chapter eight covers communication systems, so the good news is uh, you probably won't have to bother much with chapter eight. And then chapter nine has all the tables that are applicable as reference, things like your ohms per kilofoot tables and things of that nature that will be covered. So um, here's a great diagram of that. So Chapter one is kind of general information. Chapter two is wiring and protection. That's where you're going to find things about um, uh, overcurrent protection, uh, um, grounding, work, uh, things along that line. And then when you actually are sizing wire and working with um, things like that, you'll find that in chapter three. And then other equipment for general use. 
And then chapters 5, 6, and 7 supplement or modify those chapters. And then you've got chapters 9 and the annex. Uh, kind of a tricky, tricky thing. They could have you in the um, exam look up something in an annex and understand that the annexes uh, don't, are not uh, mandatory. So they're informational, they're helpful, they provide guidance, but it's not um, required that you do something if it's listed somewhere in the annex. So the non-mandatory information annex is contained in the back of the code book or for information only and aren't enforceable as a requirement of the NEC. They could refer to that and then ask you if, you know, what um, authority having jurisdiction would be required to enforce an annex. And you'd have to know, uh, hopefully one of the choices would be uh, they're not enforceable. And, um, you know, people not, that don't know about that might get snagged up with something like that. Okay, so if you haven't done so already, the first place to start in familiarizing yourself with the code book is Article 100. I'm not going to go through these definitions, but there are a lot there that, that pertain to things that are referenced in the code book. If you don't understand something, um, or you think, even if you think you do, uh, come back here and uh, read through it. People that are teaching advanced classes, people that work in the industry a lot, sometimes use words incorrectly or use words interchangeably that really aren't interchangeable. Uh, for example, conduit body. You know, uh, we think of conduit as the um, as, as anything that you know you're putting wire in, and then there's this word raceway. Well, what's what's the difference between the two? Um, Conduit would be something that provides access to a removable cover to the interior of the system at a junction of two or more sections of the system or at a terminal point of the system. A raceway are the actual tubes that can be made out of various materials. So when you get further down in Article 100, it gives you the definition. Okay? Uh, again, you know, it sounds like you're splitting hairs, but really um, there's ways they can trip you up in the wording of questions. One of the really important things to know, and this is crucial, are the difference between these three terms right here. And they're right here in Article 100. Okay, so if, it's, if you're reading a question and they're throwing terminology around and you're getting yourself confused, come back. It's defined here. You don't have to memorize this. All right, so what does it say? Uh, I'm going to shift this over so that I'm not covered up with my pen here. But there's the word grounding. Okay. Um, Okay, the, the ECG, or the EGC, excuse me, the Equipment um, Grounding Conductor. This is the conductive path installed to connect normally non-current carrying metal parts of the equipment together and to carry the grounded conductor, carry, I'm sorry, together and to the system grounded conductor or to the grounding electrode conductor or both. Um, it's recognized that the equipment grounding conductor also performs bond bonding. And for a list of acceptable equipment grounding conductors, see Article 250, I'm sorry, Section 250.118. So um, if you're, uh, that's where you get that. Grounding electrode is the conducting object through which a direct connection, connection to Earth is established. So that's the actual um, bar that gets hammered down into the ground. And depending on how much current it's carrying, um, potentially, that determines the diameter of that grounding electrode and the length and how that gets installed. So that's the actual rod itself is the grounding electrode. The grounding electrode conductor is a conductor used to connect the system grounded conductor or the equipment to a grounding electrode. So that's the piece that comes out of that main service panel and runs down and connects to the grounding electrode. Um, and that would be or some sort of point, point on the grounding electrode system, which can sometimes be a metal pipe in a building under certain circumstances. So um, grounding conductor, that's usually a neutral um, in an AC circuit. Um, it could be the green conductors that run through the circuit coming on the DC side. And uh, ultimately, that will end up getting on a bonded to a bar that connects to a grounding electrode conductor and ultimately to a grounding electrode. So that's why sometimes in John Wiles' articles he refers to the uh, black 
um, wire or the negative on the DC side as the grounded conductor because ultimately, you know, where that passes through a um, junction box into a combiner box, into a disconnect, into the inverter, into the AC disconnect, and ultimately to the distribution panel, that conductor is going to ultimately ground to that grounding electrode conductor and to the grounding electrode. So that's its purpose is all the way through the system. If you follow that, you'll see that ultimately at the last point, it connects to a grounding electrode and bonds down to that grounding electrode conductor. So that's why he called that one the grounded conductor. Okay. Um, the hot, the red on the DC side, the, the L1, L2, red and black on the, on the AC side, or the red, black, and blue in Austin, or the red, black, and orange in other jurisdictions, L1, L2, L3 on a, um, a three-phase system. Those are the ones that are ungrounded because they're the ones that are live carrying the current. And so they're ungrounded, and they run through the system carrying the current to, um, throughout you know, the, the DC side and connecting out the AC side um, as the live uh, lines, and that's why they're ungrounded. They don't ultimately connect to the grounded electrode or the grounding electrode conductor. They, uh, they ultimately connect to the load and carry the current. So they're ungrounded, they're live, they're hot, and they're also always referred to as ungrounded conductors in a, in a circuit, okay? So make sure you, I know this is confusing because they all sound similar, but if you stare at some line diagrams, and there's some great diagrams in my course book as well as in the uh, NEC handbook, you start to get a feel for this stuff, and uh, it's, it's not as confusing as it seems. Okay. Um, all right. A couple of other uh, neutral conductors. Okay. Let's see what that means while we're on the subject. All right. Conductor connected to the neutral point of a system that is intended to carry current under normal conditions. No neutral point. Common point on a Y connection in a polyphase system or midpoint on a single phase three wire system. Um, uh, or a midpoint on a single phase portion of a three wire delta uh, directing direct current system. So a neutral point of the system, the vectoral sum of all other phases within the system um, that neutral that utilize the neutral with respect to the neutral point is zero potential. So that's that um, usually neutral intended to carry current under normal conditions, but that one is, is the one that ultimately gets bonded um, to ground. Okay? All right. Live parts, okay, that's important to understand what we just went over as far as um, working clearances, energized conductive components. So it says clearly in those working space questions, you know, they have to be, like, for example, under 150 volts, it said three feet distance between live parts. So that doesn't mean the wall that the panel is mounted to or the wall that the inverter is mounted to. That means the actual space between the terminals that are inside and might be two or three inches extended from the wall when you open up the cover, and then the actual breakers on the other side. So the room itself might need to be even bigger than that, right? So there's ways to get caught up in that. And why, do, why does NAVSEP test on that? Because, you know, a customer builds an equipment room or a mechanical room that they have things installed in and it was designed and built out according to code, the inside of that small room might have only been, you know, three feet wide or three and a half feet wide, thinking that the equipment would be about six, you know, inches off the wall. And then there's this beautiful wall in there that's not being used at all, and they say, well, you can just put all the inverters and stuff in here. And uh, not according to code. If you're having live parts, opposing live parts in the same room, and especially TV where you might see voltages well exceeding 150 volts um, coming in on the DC you know, disconnect prior to the inverter, then you would need four feet of clearance for it, okay? Um, and if that room isn't built that way, you know, a good installer that understands the code would say, I'm sorry, I can't put it in this room. I know it's beautiful, beautiful empty wall here, uh, but it's not far enough away from this wall in order to be code compliant. So these are the experience things that people that do solar for a living come across when they deal with customers on a regular basis and know their code. And so that's definitely the kind of thing that NABSEP 
um, when they say you're a certified installer and you're going out to do site inspections and things of that nature, um, you know, part of your the reason why these things are tested in the NEC, I mean, the NAVSEP test, is so that you um, would walk into a room like that and a customer telling you, this is where I want it, be able to say, well, I'm sorry, sir, you, know, you can't have it there. Um, okay, so in the, when you're dealing with MEMA ratings, this is one of the problem sets. Um, dry location, okay, but not, not normally subject to dampness or wetness, classified as dry may be temporarily subject to dampness or wetness, as in the case of a, a building under construction. Um, wet locations, installations underground or in concrete slabs or in masonry in direct contact with the earth, in locations subject to saturation with water or other liquids, such as vehicle washing areas, and in unprotected locations exposed to weather. Okay, we're going to have some of that one in just a minute. Um, all right, overcurrent protection. Overcurrent. Any current in excess of the rated current of equipment or the impacting of a conductor may result in an overload from some overload, short circuit, or a ground fault. Um, okay, so overcurrent protection device. Uh, this is one that stumped me until, you know, all, all my life I heard of fuses and breakers and, you know, OCPD, you know, and I get into this. A fuse or a break. And they're rated. They're rated in terms of their interrupting rating. Understand what that means. Um, they're rated in terms of whether they can be backfed or not. Pretty much all um, breakers that are being uh, manufactured and sold today are capable of both put pushing power out to loads as well as accepting back feeds. But it's something, if it's not labeled, that's usually the case. But if it's labeled that it's for servicing loads only, uh, then you cannot use that as a back fed breaker. And I do remember there was a question that got at that concept on my test. Um, sometimes getting through these code books reminds me of those questions that I um, forgot um, after I left the test and went uh, some attitude adjustment. Um, okay, so there's that definition of raceway. It gives you all the different types of conduit, all the different types of raceways and what that means. Another who would have thought the difference between rain proof and rain tight? Okay, um, but there's that they, they can throw that in a question. So uh, do spend time here with these things, Article 100, because it, it comes up in the questions. And um, here's one that's getting a lot of attention. And uh, in fact, there was a whole article when the 2011 code book came out last year about this definition of qualified person. And a, there may be a question on this because um, this was unprecedented change in the 2011 code book. Um, one who, you know, qualify, are you qualified? Yeah, I went to a class. I'm qualified. Um, not according to any, that has an actual definition. And in fact, it's defined specifically in um, the NFPA 70E handbook that, is, that was listed in the NAB step as one of the resources you should have. Um, but it, it's gone ahead here and defined better, and we'll get to that in Article 690 today, but one who has the skills and knowledge related to construction operation of the electrical equipment installation has received safety training to recognize and avoid, avoid the hazards involved. Um, if you look to, um, I'm going to go jump to Article 690 really quick, uh, this is what got all the hullabaloo, and if, if you look at some of the um, comments before the code book came out of... Um, what uh, people were saying about the code book, and um, okay, I want to go to the next one. Uh, right. I'm not sure exactly which one it is. It's going to take some of getting here this way. I think um, I got a code book here. I'll jump to. 690.7, there we go. I want to show you there, they changed this word definition of uh, qualified person. Okay. So, okay, just a little bit, see if back to what that code reference is. This is a new one for, okay, so start here. This is the beginning of that section. 
And again, each um, article has its own definitions, and so that's another thing to, to pay attention to if you haven't already. And as we go through the labeling that's required. I'm going to come back to this, but I want to show you what now says related to qualified persons. soon. I totally forgot this. What's that? specifically here. One second here. We'll look this up specifically. And then we're going to go into solving these problems. So. We are here. I'm just looking something up real quick. Well, maybe we'll come across it later, but just know that in Article 690, there's a new reference to what it means to be a qualified person. And what it says is that you have to have had training specific to um, uh, portable takes. And therefore, um, people that even if they have a, a electric license, technically need to be receive some sort of training in order to be qualified to work on photovoltaic systems. And it's just looking for where that's referenced here in the new code book. Um, there's an article 700. Okay, that's why I'm not finding it. Anyways, uh, Richard will look that up, and then I'll get back with you. Okay, so. Uh, Back to, um, we're going to now jump into the problem set, and I'll be coming back to the code book. And uh, I just wanted to leave you with the notion that um, you need to spend, understand how the code book is organized. And uh, it's definitely one of the changes. Okay. Um, so let's get to the problem set, and we'll start going over some of the answers that will take us back into the code book um, as needed. Okay. So Article 705.6. Let me take it back and just read it real quick. 
If I put in here, 705.6, and here's what it says. Not 06, so we got to go up here. This is what I was referring to. System installation says installation of one or more electrical power production. Um, here's where I'm at. Installation of one or more electrical power production sources operating in parallel with the primary source of electricity mm -hmm. shall be installed only by qualified persons. See Article 100 for definition of, art of, of uh, qualified persons. Um, in solar, what that now means is somebody that has received training with respect to safety, as we saw there in um, Article 100. So if someone's working with solar equipment and they haven't received training specifically in working safely with photovoltaics, then technically they do not qualify, even if they're a licensed electrician, to work on solar. Uh, this is something that in an issue last summer in 2011 of Solar Pro, several people were commenting on and saying that this was unprecedented, that you needed special training relative to the equipment um, because generally, you know, journeymen or master electricians are, are licensed in most states to do any kind of electrical work. And then here they're saying, that they must be sold by people that have received that actual safety training in that type of equipment. So that's a big change and got several pages and pages of comments during the review cycle for the uh, 2011 code book uh, release. Okay. All right. I lost time there, but okay. So let's get into some of these code questions that I wrote yesterday and let's, let's um, see where we're at. So. Okay, uh, in a separate outbuilding, this is one I was kind of alluding to, even though we were talking about the code, uh, on a college campus, three 120-volt, um, 280-volt sub-panels are mounted inside the building along with electrical equipment for an HVAC system. The customer wants the PV installer to install the equipment consisting of a 5KW, 240-volt PV inverter, disconnects, and a rec meter in the same building on the opposite wall. What is the minimum distance between the sub-panels and the PV equipment? Um, so I didn't say live parts. Um, I didn't say the wall. Uh, NABSEP sometimes is vague like this, and you know the code is specific where it says live parts to live parts, and then they'll say, um, you know, uh, what they want. So um, we're going to – you have to sometimes make a leap of faith. And I deliberately was not specific because really, regardless of whether it's live parts or not live parts, all the other answers other than the correct one um, are uh, indicative of something smaller. And do we have volts greater than 150? We do. We do in the sub-panel that could be a 208 volt circuit coming out on a, uh, that could also be um, the 240 volt inverter that uh, the solar system is going to have. So the only answer here that would work then would be this one here, um, which would be uh, uh, indicate the correct answer here. Um, symbol panel up. I can throw a check mark next to the one that I want. Okay, so that would be your answer for this one. Okay. Um, we went over that just now in depth, so I'm not going to spend too much time there. Problem number two. The height of a ground-mounted PV system or pole-mounted PV system with exposed live PV wires. Coming out of the junction box in the back of the module are live wires. Uh, some modules, they come out, and if you open up that junction box, you void the warranty. And so uh, without manufacturer's approval, which you would find in their um, materials that come with the equipment, uh, if you're not allowed to open up that junction box and it's got cables that come right out of it, and um, how are you going to attach conduit to something like that? And if it's coming right out of the junction box and you can't put in a strain release that um, goes right into conduit, 
uh, you may not be able to use those modules if that installation is, at a, is not of, of a proper height. And so they could show you the back of a picture of the back of a module that shows one of those kinds of junction boxes. And then you need to know that based on, you know, the manufacturer's uh, recommendations where you cannot um, open that junction box to change the strain relief around those conductors, uh, you'd have to either mount that thing above a certain height or, um, or not be able to use those modules in that installation. And so as an installer, you know, you go online, you order the modules, you, you know, this is the kind of question that NABCEP wants to hit you at because these are the mistakes that are made in the field that then lead to people, customers, paying for equipment that can't be used, uh, installers trying to make do with things based on, these, well, the pole's already built or the ground mount's already there or whatever it is, and, uh, you know, they just kind of wink and a nod do things that are not code compliant. So this is a tough one to find. Um, if you look in Article uh, 690, okay, um, it says, I'm going to find this before I um, actually start scrolling through the code book because it's not moving very fast, and I try to use it, and I'm about to become grandmother that I am not. Uh, but in Article 690, it says that, um, you know, when you're installing something, that it uh, – cannot be readily accessible unless the, if there, if the, system, the cables are not the conduit, it cannot be readily accessible. So uh, where does it go? Okay, so where it says they cannot be made readily accessible, then you've got to go to Article 100, where we looked at that a second ago, and it says readily accessible means that, that people would have access to those exposed live parts. So then live parts means it's parts that could be carrying, um, a, car, a live part is something that could be energized and carrying current. So is a PV cable coming out the back of a junction box a live part? Yes, it is. So... Right there, I've looked in Article 690, I've looked in Article 100 in two different places to define those terms. And now, you know, so what, do, so what does that maximum height need to be um, to not be readily accessible? Uh, in Article 100, um, it, it gives a definition of that. Let me get back to Article the code for a second. We're going to go to... Oops. Where this answer actually is, because I had a master electrician of 30 years argue with me on this during a class last year and say, where does it say that in the code book, what the answer is to that? I always thought it was six feet, you know? So I said, well, here it is. Let's find it. So I happen to know it's Article 110.27, and here it is. Here's what it says. Live parts guarded against accidental contact. So... Except as elsewhere required in the code, live parts of electrical equipment operating at 50 volts or more shall be guarded against actual contact by approved enclosures in, or, or by any of the following means. So by locating it in a room, vault, or similar enclosure that's accessible only by qualified persons, by suitable permit, um, substantial partitions or screens. So if it's less than that, that means you could have it surrounded by a fence, which is okay. Um, so if you've got a small... You know, a ground mount system where you want the parts to be exposed, what you might think of then is to put a fence around it. That is acceptable. Is that, um, that uh, any openings or such partitions will be sized to locate that person is not likely to come into accidental contact with live parts or bring objects into contact with them. A location on a suitable balcony, gallery, or platform elevated and arranged so as to exclude unqualified persons. How high does that have to be? 2.5 meters or which is eight feet or more above the ground or working space. So there's your answer. 
go back to the question, and we see that um, using this right here, eight feet is the only acceptable answer. Um, okay, so that's where you find it, and that took four different places in the code, and I'm sorry I don't have it readily available where it says that um, systems must be guarded uh, within Article 690, but I do know that it says that. Um, and I will come across it in a little while to point that out to you. Sometimes I'm not exactly. Uh, And the word says that you would, um, make reference to that readily accessible, but it's in there. Okay, let's look at the next one. And by the way, uh, this one was on my version of the exam in September of 2010. So I'm not supposed to quote actual maps of questions, but this was one of them. Okay. Back to the PowerPoint and slide number. Next slide, please. Oh, we got to insert in the slide. All right, we're going to build problem number three. These are the sample problems that were posted uh, last evening that we did based on the MEC code in preparation for um, Janet Hughes's lecture. So what I'm going to do here is highlight question three off this sample and paste that into my PowerPoint, and then we'll develop the answer. So here I am in here. Okay, um, what NEMA rating would be required for a combiner box located on a roof in a coastal community subject to monsoon rains at various times of the year? So this is situational. You know, you're, in a, you're doing a system in Hawaii, or in the Caribbean, or somewhere or, or in South Florida, or in the Keys, Somewhere where you're uh, you're getting um, you know potentially salt air, okay? That's what coastal community means. So they don't tell you that per, per se, but that's what they mean when they say coastal community. Whoops. And okay. So that's this part here. That means salt water. That would mean um, stainless steel, if that had to do with the type of uh, mounting structure that would, you know, and, and that you'd want to have, um, or, or you know, that would be resistant to, to corrosion. And um, so, just like when you think of boats and the kind of uh, hardware you see for the rails and the chrome on the boat, um, you wouldn't have aluminum. You know, you wouldn't have things that are subject to corrosion in salt air, so when you see the word coastal, that's NABCEP's code word for something where you might have salt in the air, okay? Uh, monsoon rain, that means not only, you know, sustained weather, you know, like you were looking at, rain tight and rain proof, um, that means that it's going to be something that could, you know, depending on the, the monsoon and where it's located, and if it's on a roof with parapet walls, it doesn't have adequate drainage, what, what if that, you know, device is actually hurt? Or, or actually hose, you know, we you look at the way the NEMA things are, there's a way to kind of make this make sense. So um, there's three different choices they've given us here. Uh, three, NEMA three, three X, four, and four X. Oh, by the way, this was something that I remember seeing on my test as well. So let's go a little bit further down in uh, this article 100. And that's where you're going to find those NEMA ratings. So here we are. Okay, so definitely it's outdoor use. And let's read what it says. All right, so uh, firstly, see where it says, um, This and I want my chance. Okay, so um, here's my uh, enclosure selection. 
okay, for outdoor use. And these are my NEMA ratings right here, okay? So um, it gives me four, four choices, 3, 3X, 4, and 4X. And they've given me this conditions of use, which are a coastal community, okay, which may have corrosive agents. Um, and uh, it might, you know, it's not just rain, snow, or sleet, right? In this case, and it's not, it's actually what we would consider hose down. So when I look in category three, that's not going to work. Look in 3X, that would work um, with the corrosive benefits, but, and it would work in rain, okay, but it's not going to work in a hose down situation, in a monsoon situation. NEMA 4 is going to work in that monsoon, but because it's possibly subject to corrosive agents, being in the salt air, um, the only answer that works is 4X. Okay, so uh, that's a lot of mess on my page, but basically, you know, it's not just rain. You need to interpret that monsoon, and, and that just doesn't tell you this, to be basically like a hose down situation. Okay, um, they didn't, if we think it might be enough monsoons where it could be the temporarily or prolonged submersion, then we would be looking at, at 6 or 6P, okay? Um, and it would have to be 6P because we need that corrosive element as well. And 6 doesn't have it. But 6P wasn't a choice. So, um, and if it was, that would be then, you know, one of the things I might write up. When you get to the end of the exam, there's a comment sheet. And depending on you, how you interpret some of the questions, you're allowed to write a comment. One of the reasons it takes NABSEPs four weeks to give you a result is they read these comments. And if you were given 6P and 4X as a possible answer, um, now it's up to interpretation, okay? Both of them include corrosive. One of them works with hose down. The other one works with submersion. So now, how do you pick, okay? Um, and that's where I would, and they're both possible answers. I would take time at the end of the exam to write up an answer that says, you know, my interpretation of that. And when NAPSEP reads your description on why you think both 6P and 4X could be right answers, depending on how you interpret this monsoon rain and what that could result in on a flat roof in a coastal community, um, sometimes they say, you know what, we didn't think of that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get both those answers correctly. And that's why, or they might even throw the question out altogether based on your uh, comment that says, you know, that was, I see where you're going with this, uh, and I see that you're trying to be clever using the word monsoon, uh, but honestly, you know, depending on how that's interpreted and what could happen in a particular rooftop setting where that combiner box might be, um, here's how I'm seeing it. And under those, my interpretation, you know, I'm going to go ahead and put 4X because I think that's what you mean, but, um, you know, uh, technically 6P could be a, uh, a right answer if that actually ended up getting submerged as a result of those monsoon rates, okay? And um, so uh, just let you know that you have that ability, and that's why they take the time, and that's also why sometimes you see weird scores coming back where a passing score is a, you know, a 71.5, you know, or, and, and that doesn't really equally divide um, among 60 questions because they may find that necessary to throw out a question because somebody writes in the comment interpreting it. So uh, you do have that right, and I guarantee I wrote up four different questions at the end of the exam, and um, you know this, uh, you have that ability to do so and, uh, and and do it when you feel that the test is ambiguous because that's the biggest complaint about this test, that some questions are open to interpretation when they get situational. Um, one question I remember while we're on the subject had to do with safety, and the question said, uh, Whose responsibility is it to determine when to use personal protective equipment? Okay. Um, the, the, the possible answers were, and maybe I'll just type this up as a question in PowerPoint right now. We can be talking to something. It's just, um, those that I weren't here in the beginning, I'm using Richard's machine and he's just your tech for some time. So, the right answer here, before I move on, was 4X, as we saw, and um, so all right, I'll just, I'm checking this now. Um, we'll move on now. So uh, I'm going to ad hoc 
sort of this question I'm about to tell you about, and I have ADD, so you get to put up with me. Ad hoc safety question. And the reason I'm doing this now is because I'm thinking about it, and this is on my list. So whose responsibility is it to determine when to use PPE? And the choices were foreman, customer, PV installer, or employer? Employer. You got it. And why do you say? Can you tell me? Is it, when I go, if I'm out there in the field and I go pick up my, uh, you know, I get, I'm about to go over and test, you know, the voltage on the combiner box, um, and it could be high, you know, uh, no one else is up on the roof with me. So isn't it my responsibility as the installer to put up my, my uh, equipment on and put on my gloves and put on my baklava and my helmet and my, you know, all that? Isn't it my job when I'm going about, about to go over there and, and, and take that measurement? Well, the employer is supposed to say it again. when it's appropriate to use PBE. Right. Okay. So, uh, and who's that that gave that answer? This is Mike Riley. Mike. Okay, great. Um, I, in my OSHA training, I looked and looked and looked and looked to this. When I came out of the exam, all the IBW electricians I took the test with, because they work in the field all the time. And safety is something that can get their company in trouble, can get their employer in trouble, and can get them in trouble. And so once they're trained on when to use what equipment, on what equipment is being provided based on the nature of the job, they're also told, and when you get out there when you're doing your job and you don't use the equipment when you're supposed to, you know, you're fired because you could get us subject to a, to a fine or, or a, a violation. So as they work day in, day out in the field under the supervision of a foreman, under the, after having been trained and provided with the proper PPE by the employer, the actual moment they go to perform something that requires them to put on their PPE, and that when, the way they were looking at it, they thought it was their responsibility. And based on the way their job goes on a day-to-day -day basis, that's how they're told to perform in the field. And they all came out having clicked the PV installer. But according to OSHA, as Mike said, um, the way this question is written, and it's really word for word out of an OSHA manual, it is the employer's responsibility based on the nature of the work that's being, you know, uh, performed to look at what's being required, source the proper PPE for that work, and train people on when to use it in the course of the work they're going to be doing. And so uh, the correct answer to this question is, um, employer. But when you talk to guys that are out there in the field, uh, that's not how they see it. And so this was something that I wrote up, you know. Um, when I'm getting trained, you know, and when someone's actually determining what I need to be having access to and what they need to purchase for me to have, yeah, that's the employer, okay. But when I'm actually out there and I may be by myself about to go do something that requires me to put it on, at that moment, at that when, you know, it's my job. And so there could actually be two different ways of interpreting a question that, that is kind of vague in a way if you look at it that way. And um, so uh, just so you know, that was kind of one of those splitting hairs questions. Um, all right, while we're on it, let's type another one that got, had pulled my hair out. <laughs> um, so let's insert another new slide. And Mike, let's see if you got this one too. Okay, ad hoc question. Number two, okay, said uh, you are on a job site and a worker uh, drops a wrench, PV installation, let's say, um, uh, down, uh, drops a wrench, and in reaching to retrieve it, uh, next to a battery, um, I have to do it this way, he slash she, <laughs> uh, incurs a, uh, gets a um, mild, a small, 
cut and a mild shock. Uh, to the correct course of action. Oh. Okay. Um, do you treat? Sorry for my. Do you treat the wound and send him or her back to work? Do you treat the wound? Send them home. Do you drive them to the hospital? Or call 911. Mike, what do you say? I'm going to say treat the wound and send them home so they have an opportunity to um, fill an incident report out or contact a doctor or something like that. To, um, and, and what makes you think that? I mean, let's look at the question, right? It's a small cut. Happens all the time on the job, right? I mean, there's, there's tons of things around that you can get a tiny cut from. But, you know, you want to treat it because there's blood and stuff like that, right? And what else? Right. A, a mild shock. So that can happen often. But, um, you know, there was a couple key things here. Um, one, they throw in that word battery, okay? Oops. Back to PowerPoint. Um, gosh, just computer moves fast. I want this. Okay. They fill in this word battery. And, and battery is a DC source of power where if, it, if, it, if someone gets a shock from it, that's a deep, direct current and it isn't, isn't going to stop. So they may, we don't really know how long that person vibrated as they retrieved that wrench next to that battery. They may be a tough guy or gal and like, no, oh, it was nothing, you know. Um, but depending on the duration of that shock coming off a battery, um, it could have been minimal, it could have been mild, and, and they may have be used to this and think, you know, um, there's nothing. But, but based on the duration coming from a battery, um, it actually could be more serious than they know. This person could have an underlying heart condition that has never triggered anything because they've never had a shock before. It could be something hereditary that they don't even know is there. And they may be a little agitated or excited as a result of that shock, but, uh, you know, they want to go back to work. They don't want to lose time. They don't want to lose hours. Um, you know, and, and as Mike said, the foreman says, no, why don't you go home? That way if you're starting to feel weird, you can go to the hospital, you can go see a doctor, you can get treated. Um, that was, um, I have to say, that, that that's the one I chose. <laughs> and... Uh, that probably of all of them is, is the least right answer because if that person lives alone and they go home and they end up with suffering some kind of a heart attack as a result of an fibrillation, there's going to absolutely be nobody there to get them to a hospital. And now you're sending them not only home and not to treat it, not to get immediate medical attention, um, but you're sending them into a situation where they might end up by themselves. And so uh, that, that could actually be the worst of all. Um, if I send them back to work, they might be subject to being unstable. They could drop a tool, uh, do something that causes an unsafe situation for somebody else on the job site. Um, so now they're, without realizing that they're a little bit wheezy, they're not thinking clearly, and, and now their mental faculties might make them a danger to themselves as well as everybody else they work with. So I would say, according to this, that that's the second worst answer. But then you get down to these two here. Do I drive them to the hospital or do I call 911? And this is where I wrote it up, where I would recommend you write it up. I didn't write it up. I, like I say, I chose this one like an idiot. Um, and, and, Mike, I'm not calling you an idiot. I'm just saying when you look at these questions, I called myself that afterwards because when you look at these questions, imagine the worst-case scenario. The guy goes home and he does have a heart attack. And his wife comes home from work at 6 o'clock and he's laying dead in the bedroom. You know, this is her husband. This is her, you know, partner, is someone she cares about, and she's out to now get everybody and anybody that was on that job site that day that made a decision of what to tell him to do after he reported that he was injured. And a lawsuit ensued. Now you're sitting on the witness stand, and this is how you approach these kinds of cases. 
any good lawyer is going to come up to you and say, so, you were there, you were working next to him, and what was your first course of action? Uh, well, I told him you better go tell somebody, you know. And what did the foreman do? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Um, so you, you thought that was the right thing? You, you're a doctor, you're trained medical staff, you know better that the person should just go report it to the foreman, you know, you know that? And in questioning, they start tearing you down, making it look like, you know, you were acting like you were an authority on the matter, you or the foreman or other people on the job site, and made the decision that it wasn't that serious without knowing anything about this guy's medical history or doing any kind of medical test. Um, so, you know, in, in any kind of document, it's going to say you want to get them to trained medical personnel as quickly as possible. And that's what OSHA will say. So the quickest way to do that in a city or in an area where there's proper uh, first responders would be to call 911 because they're going to, you know, run red lights and do whatever they need to to get there as quickly as possible. As soon as they get on the scene, they're going to be able to tell whether that person is um, medically, uh, you know, in trouble or not, in which case they would drive them to the emergency room. Um, if, if it takes time for that person to get there, if you're out in a rural location where you know this person needs to be checked out by a trained medical person and calling 911 might actually take longer than if you were to drive, because where they're coming from, you know, the hospital is between their dispatch and where your job site is. Uh, the right thing in the rural setting might be to drive them to the hospital. So if, if I was kind of aware of that, this is one that I would that I would write up and say, yes, obviously the legally most not negligent negligent thing to do would be to call 911. That's going to get the fastest response. Get medical trained staff to check this person out, right? But if I'm in a rural setting and it takes longer fastest way to train medical personnel might be to drive to the hospital. And so under those circumstances and with this question, not being specific about where this is taking place, technically, C could be the best answer to get them quickest to, 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 to train medical personnel. And unless you're a card-carrying doctor or someone like that, then you are not that person. And so that's why numbers one and two uh, don't work, okay? So I, I remember this one by heart because, you know, especially these electricians I talk to. What happens in the field? Mild ball cut, mild shock. Sometimes they don't even tell anybody. They just keep on working, you know. Um, treat the wound and send them home. Okay, that's it, you know. All right, you know, we'll give them a break, and that way if something happens, you can, you can get himself to the hospital and get the rest of the day off, right? And uh, But um, neither one of those, and that's reality. Unfortunately, that's why this kind of question exists. Because people with a lot of experience, they're out on these job sites all the time, they're going to instantly go to what really happens out in the field a lot of times, which actually is not the correct thing according to OSHA. And so that's precisely why NABSEP puts these kind of questions on the exam. So both of the last questions I gave you related to safety are interpretive, situational. Uh, there may be questions out there that deal with, you know, non-conductive rails on the uh, ladder or six feet or greater for fall protection that are strictly, you know, applying definitions and standards. Um, but don't be surprised to see questions like this where um, you've got to be able to think through, you know, what the uh, most appropriate course of action is to make yourself able to sit there on the witness stand and say to any lawyer, I did immediately the best thing I knew how to do, which was getting trained medical licensed, you know, qualified medical personnel on the site as quickly as possible. And in fact, in that working safely with TV systems document, it says in some instances, maybe the best way to do that if you're up on top of a rooftop and it's going to take you 10 minutes to come down and notify somebody, um, pull a fire alarm. They're going to, that's going to send a signal directly to the fire station and get somebody there even quicker. So uh, depending on the circumstance, you know, that could be even the best thing to do. And um, who's going to argue with you in a court of law that you didn't do the most best thing to get the people there as quickly as possible to check this guy out and determine what was the appropriate thing past that. And if that's not you, then you got to look at the answers on what you'd want to say to a lawyer uh, that gets you out of the, and gets you out of hot water that you did what you should have. All right. Okay. Um, let's get back to the other problems now. So we had problem number three was about NEMA. Let's get back to uh, my Word document. Word. And question number four was 
a biggie. And this one dealt with trenches, which is also a great diagram on my cult uh, book. So in, we're, what we're doing for those of you that joined late is that uh, we're building slide solution sets. That this video will be available after the session, just like Richard's is from yesterday. Those of you that missed yesterday's Richard's study session, you can download that YouTube video. It's three hours long with him solving some problem sets out of the NAVSHIP guide. Um, but uh, he posted these problems last night as a precursor to content domain number three. And so instead of us sitting here, uh, we thought maybe you guys would enjoy us actually uh, working through these solution sets with you while you study. So problem number four. Okay. Okay. Got it. Over here. Sixteen, and here we go. All right. Ground mounted PV radios is installed on the south side of a farmhouse. Um, on the outside, on the opposite side of a covered parking area used to protect the tractor, a bushwhacker, and a shredder. The trench bringing the USD conductors back to the barn. Actually, this has got a typo. It should say on a parking structure. Started this in a different direction with it. On the south side of a um, uh, opposite of a Parking structure, and redo this one. Hmm. Not the side. Of a Barn. Okay. That's, now that's what I wanted. I wanted the parking structure on the other side of the driveway, and the parking structure itself holds heavy machinery. That was what I was trying to get at here. So um, the barn is where the interconnection is, and so there's going to have to be a trench that goes from the parking structure where all this equipment is underneath the driveway um, back over to the barn. Okay, so the trench bringing those USC conductors back to the barn where the main service panel will run under the parking area as well as the driveway leading to the barn. Soil is mostly clay and brown dirt. So that's important. Um, it's not rocks. So based on that, the trench depth must be at least, hmm. So in the Mike Holt book where this one was described, um, that one, we turn to page. He shows these various trench depths. And I think that made a bit of an article 200 somewhere. We're getting into now Article 200, which dealt with um, Hmm. You know, it might not be in the PV book. Might, that diagram might have only been in the um, NEC book. Yes. So I apologize. In his Mike Holt's book on changes to the NEC, in article, sorry, not article section. I make that mistake a lot. I'm sorry. Page what is it? Page 113 in the Mike Holt book. In the PV book? Yes. Okay. Page, page 113. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. On page 113, article 300.5 shows a. This is a. Got my screen. This is the diagram here that shows the trenches, and it very clearly shows. 
um, different situations. So if you would look that up. Okay, so I got, there's four columns. UF or USB cables or conductors, which is what this one does. Um, but I could could have a they could the question should say could say uh, different uh, cable such as um, raceway. It could say PVC not encased in concrete. It could say um, a different kind of circuit. The GFCI is going to be um, ground fault circuit interrupter over there. So depending on the situation, you've got to look at this chart and then it says um, let's look in the code book now. Okay, let's because that you're not going to get the Mike Holt book in the exam. So where do we find this in the code book? We're looking at article 300.5. And see, in the this is the first reference. Interesting. Shall we permit this old race range? Plus one. Okay, there's an article 110 they talked about this in the first thing. And the next part, again, is referred to in a seal. Um, protecting against damage, underground service conductors, maybe in accordance with Article 300.5. Multiple references. I'll hopefully we get to the actual underground physical damage in accordance with Article 300.5. Wiring methods, very important. That's about 5. Oh, we want dot five. And are we there yet? Are we there yet? Okay, minimum cover requirements. So here's how it's going to be when you're in the exam. Record carol, cable of conduit or other ratios shall be installed to meet the minimum cover requirements of table 300.5. Wet locations, it describes that. Underground cables under buildings. Okay, and so now let's look at the table. That's what you're going to need to read when you're using the book during the exam. So this is direct aerial cables or conductors. Um, and it gives certain conditions over here on the left. So um, it's saying under streets, highways, roads, driveways, and parking lots. All right. So uh, we talked about a parking lot uh, and a driveway leading a parking lot for that heavy equipment that, you know, you want to have enough cover material to protect against the heavy vehicles. That's why... Um, and here it says uh, streets, driveways, alleys, parking lots, one and two family dwelling driveways and outdoor parking areas used only for dwelling related purposes. So that means like cars. So the fact that I made this a, a barn situation with a heavy tractor and shredders, um, this again is open to interpretation. If this is a residence, you know, where one or two family lives and the way this is, no. The, you could interpret the 18 inches that is seen right here. Um, but I think, you know, they go to the, I went to the extent of um, putting the, uh, I my ultimate pen on my head. Um, went to the extent, I didn't give you 18 inches as a choice. So, therefore, the only correct answer uh, would be the um, 24 inches. So that would be this one over here, and that would be right there. Okay? Um, so, again, these are the kind of questions that it gives you. They're situational. Um, I deliberately described the soil as clay and dirt. I didn't say rock or concrete. Uh, so, you know, you've got to get a firm understanding of what your, what, how the conductors were going to be, um, whether they were going to be in conduit or kind of conduit. Um, you know, you've really got to read carefully the question to see what they're, they're interpreting there. Okay? All right. Interpret. Move on to the next one. Hey, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, quick comment. Yeah. Uh, somewhere around that table is a article that uh, uh, talks about the nature of the backfill that goes back into the trenches. Um, okay, yes. In terms of, okay, yes. Yes. You may want to point that out to them because... I, I sure uh, will. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Where are you? Are you listening in? <laughs> uh, well, we're dropping off recycling, actually. I'm listening in, yeah. <laughs> so you're practicing what you preach in sustainability. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. 
they get up here. All right, before I get into that one, as Richard mentioned, that is a good thing to point out at this time. So here we are in the code book. And um, again, table 300.5, knowing where that is. Where do you find out what that trench step needs to be, what that, um, depending on the situation. So we're not even anywhere near Article 690. But does this pertain to the solar installation? Absolutely. Okay. It also, um, uh, okay. Cover is defined as the shortest distance measured between the point on the top surface of any direct cable, buried cable conductor or cable conduit of the raceway and the top surface of the finished grade concrete or similar cover. So, who knows? It could continue the uh, thickness of its, if it's in conduit, you know, how tall the conduit is. And so, if the conduit itself is two and a half inch conduit and the surface how deep do you really need to go uh, to be able to bury that two and a half inch conduit and measure from the top of that conduit to the surface? It's splitting hairs, but uh, you may think that. Okay, weight trays are food for use only where concrete and case shall be no less than two inches thick. Okay, so th that's important to note. Lesser depth shall be permitted where cables uh, and conductors rise for termination or splices or where otherwise required, obviously. Uh, would be situational and something you want to check out with your AHJ. Typically, there's an inspection once trenches are dug to make sure the trenches are dug to the right length. They come out and make sure that that's the case and take measurements. But one of the wiring methods listed in columns one, two, three is used for one of the circuit types in columns four or five. The shallowest depth of burials shall be permitted. And where solid rock prevents compliance with the cover depth fired, specified in this, in this table, the wiring shall be installed in the metal or non-metallic raceway permitted for direct burial. The raceway shall be covered by a minimum of two inches of concrete extending down to the rock. So there's that, which is also talked about in Mike's book. Um, so is that what you're pertaining to, uh, Richard, or actually a whole other table? Well, it's, it's, okay. it's an article, and it's near that table, and it talks about the backfill, as in the nature of the backfill, that it not have any Got sharp, it. jagged rocks or points. I just remember that right. being a question on the test. Right. Yeah, I do, too. Let me get to that part of the code book where I can go a bit easier. Um, I don't know. I don't think that in, that may be in another table, maybe in another section. I'm gonna look up backfill. Search and see no worries, Kathy. I'll just uh, I'll find it later and uh, post it as a tweet for the Solar Moo Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm in Article 300, and it does say backfill um, in Article 310. Okay, and table table 350, there are some notes underneath that um, define what uh, those requirements are in Article 300.50, and then below that, in subsection E, it says, backfill containing large rocks, paving materials, cinders, Large or sharply angular substances or corrosive materials should not be placed in an excavation where materials can damage or contribute to the corrosion of raceways, cables, or other substructures or where it may prevent <clears throat> adequate compaction of fill. So uh, I'm not seeing a table in this section, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll come across it. We'll, like Richard says, we'll send it out in, a, uh, in the newsletter or in a um, separate communication to you. Okay, so uh, those tables, those requirements are there, and you've got to be able to understand how that works. All right, so problem number five. What is the minimum conductor size for conductors carrying a 200 amp PV output circuit um, coming from a combiner box to the DC disconnect in a large central inverter? All right, so what are the rules here? Uh, first of all, um, coming from a PV output circuit, um, if you don't already know this definition, um, just about 
every conductor in any kind of PV installation is subject to uh, this notion called continuous load. Electricians I've worked with call that the safety factor. That, that, what that means is that any time a conductor will be carrying current for a long period in excess of three hours, that's considered continuous duty or continuous load. So as a result, um, you need to always have a multiplier of what could be coming out of that um, conductor, uh, be coming over that conductor of at least 1.25. So if the um, output current is 200 amps, okay, first thing that might be the case, let's turn, I'm going to have to just jump in here for a second and get my ultimate back. I close that by mistake. There it is. Okay. There we go. All right, um, so I'm in ultimate time or I'm not. Okay, so um, it's 200 amps coming up, and so 200 amps times 1.25 gives me 250 amps under continuous duty. Um, it's also um, unsubject to an irradiance spike. So uh, that would be the second 1.25. So if I take 250 times 1.25, that gets me calculator one hundred fifty times one point two five to three hundred and twelve. Okay. So when I look at my ampacity chart on table three ten dot fifteen B. Uh, what do we find? So uh, looking in the code book, what would be the minimum capacity, I mean the minimum wire size to carry the current coming out of that combiner box? So, all right. So, um, assuming that the combiner box, without, uh, you need to know what the terminals were rated at. If the terminals were rated at 75 um, degrees, then uh, the maximum capacity on that cabling would be uh, 285 if you had answer D, which is 300 circular mils. If the terminal was rated at 90 degrees Celsius, which I'm not sure. In the combiner box, they may be. In the central inverter, they may be, being that they deal with CV circuits. But only in that instance would you be able to find a right answer in this problem, which would end up being um, this one here at um, 300 circular mils. Okay? Uh, I was facing this question when I was reading through Mike Holt smoke, and uh, he was talking about a continuous load that ran on a 200 amp circuit and was not on the DC side coming out of a combiner box um, into the DC disconnect. And so he used a multiplier of only 1.25 in that case because it was not subject to an irradiance spike. So uh, in answering this question here today, I see I caught myself. My answer key indicates that it's 250 circular mils because the maximum capacity on that wire size at 75 degrees rated terminal is 255, and that would work, okay? Um, 
But because this is on the DC side, coming out of a combiner box, let there was some sort of, um, you know, in this, in this instance, um, the correct answer would only be um, this one, and only if the terminals in the combiner box and the, set, and the DC disconnect were rated at 90 degrees. You look at that chart for wire sizing in table 310.15B16, um, if the terminals were rated at only 75 degrees, then you'd have to have another choice, which is not indicated here, um, and that would be for a cable size of 350 circular mils. So depending on where you are in the circuit between the modules and the actual connection to the main service panel, where you have that power conditioning unit, which side you're on to be able to handle or not handle that irradiant spike, um, that's what you've got to break it down. And, and that's why when I do these kinds of calculations uh, that affect intensity, I always break it up into two uh, specific calculations. I know some people that teach it, teach it where sometimes it's 1.25, sometimes it's 1.56. And for those of you that don't know, uh, 1.25 times 1.25 is 1.56. Um, but the way I like to do it is um, to look exactly what those things mean. On the dumb DC side where there's no intelligence coming from the modules to the junction box, possibly through the combiner box, through up, all the way up to a DC disconnect, all the way up to a charge controller, um, uh, where in the charge controller or in the inverter, you might have some sort of electronics that can handle that irradiant spike. Up until you get to any of those power conditioning units, um, anywhere along those, that line, you've got that irradiant spike 1.25 multiplier. Once it comes out the other side of a charge controller or an inverter, it's uh, understood that inside that power conditioning unit, that, that power is being conditioned. And if there is an irradiant spike at any moment that's causing an increased current over what that module is normally putting out in terms of amperage, it'll be handled uh, inside that power conditioning unit. Um, but throughout the circuit, from the modules all the way down to its connection into the main panel, it's always going to be running, sending current uh, on any given day for more than three hours. So always you're going to have that first 1.25. And I know this has been covered by Mike, it's been covered by Richard, it's been covered over and over again, but when you break it down into these two multipliers at 1.25 and know when they apply, what they mean, um, stick to it that way. Don't memorize sometimes 1.25 and sometimes 1.56 because then you get yourself confused. Where do these numbers come from? Why are they there? And that way, no matter what they give you, you can think yourself through. And so there's your answer, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and leave this, um, but technically, um, really, I'm gonna, you know, to make it, you know, where it might be more applicable in a real world situation, and most terminals are rated at only 75 degrees Celsius. You have to use that column, at which point you would need that um, choice here. So I'm gonna put an, Check mark for this one. Um, if the terminals are rated at 90 degrees Celsius, um, but you know this one would be the case if they're rated and. Uh, Given the choice between the two, because most, you know, uh, combiner boxes are going to be rated at, at 75, um, this is probably the most likely in reality. Okay. Any questions or comments there? Um, if you didn't know about those multipliers, uh, you might choose 4 ot which uh, under 90 degree circumstances can handle 260. Um, you might have picked even 3 aught on the 75 degree column, uh, which handles an opacity up to 200. So you really got to know where those multipliers apply and how to read that table. You can't get too much practice with that, in my opinion. All right, back to Word. Grab problem number six.
Okay. Oh, I like this one. Uh, a raceway carrying PV source circuits um, cables runs 28 feet from a junction box to the combiner box on a flat roof, small commercial PV installation. How many cable supports are required? Okay, so uh, this is also somewhere in the 300s, and I'm not mentioning the back and head code references after I did this, but um, what the code says, and it says it, ports. It would be, um, I believe it's article or uh, subsection 300.11. So let's see, I had this table up. I was doing this problem last night. Let's see what we should do. We're in 310. I need to go back. Three ten dot twenty three. Okay. I believe that what this says is up to its point of connection, you would need um, one support uh, ten inches away from where it actually goes in. Okay. Then you'd need another support every 30 inches. And should I have that in my book? So that's the rule. So in solving this problem, um, let's multiply it out. So if I have 28 feet, okay. Um, just put a little, so 28 um, times 12 gives me how many inches that is, and that equals 28 times 12, 336 inches, okay? So my first support is going to be um, 10 inches from there. So I've got um, 336 minus 10 is my first support. That's 326 inches after that. And that leaves me 326 inches divided by 30 inches between supports gives me 11.2. So. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to want to have one 10 inches on the other side as well. Actually, let me see. I need 10 on either connection side. You should actually take that 336 minus 20. Gives me 316. And then 316. Um, symbol thing here. Where's my Divided by symbol. Divided by 30 equals 316 divided by 30 equals 10.5. So I've got one on either end, 10 inches from where it connects, plus 10.5. You've got to round up 11. Um, that would be 11 plus 2. Correct answer then equals, so I'd have, whoops, I'd have 2 plus 10, sorry, 11, equals 13 supports. So why would NABSEP test you on something like this? Because that's your balance of system stuff you got to go by. Um, you know, and people that do electrical on a regular basis, they know about this code, they know about those supports. But um, I have seen inspectors come out and want to see that these PV systems have the proper supports, and uh, that's what you need to have. Okay? So 
Article 310, um, 300.22, 23, that's where these uh, um, codes are, and be able to apply that and know how much you have to buy. So that's a formula now that might come into a calculation problem on the test, okay, where, where you would find that. All right, let's go to the next one. Back to our Word documents, and we're on problem number seven. Okay. All right. So problem number seven gets us back into article table two fifty. Uh, 122, which is probably uh, a really, really, really important um, on page 91 in the Mike Holt book. In the code book, it's just look at the top, Article 250, Table 122, which is page 70-125. Uh, this tells you what the minimum size grounding conductors for equipment grounding conductors for grounding raceway or equipment. So this is what you would need um, to answer this question. All right, let me move this out of the way. All right, what, the PD output circuit conductor is incised at two aughts. What is the minimum size of the grounding electrode conductor? Okay, um, if you look at table 122, it shows me uh, on in the, tells me the amount of amperage that's being carried. Uh, in the co in my cold book, it skips a column. It shows you the overcurrent device rating, and then it shows you what the copper conductor ought to be. If you look in the cold book, it gives you um, copper rating as well as the aluminum rating. So uh, what we need to do is to understand how much current will be carried over that. I've got to go back to my table 310.15. When I was at before, and look at what a two aught cable would be carrying, and that's dot three ten dot fifteen b sixteen. So if it's a two aught cable, and I want to size something, I could be carrying um, on a ninety degree wire up to one hundred and ninety five amps. Okay. So if I look at, uh, that's the maximum rating for a 2 aught 90 degree conditions of use table. Come over here and I see that um, 195 would make that uh, 95. a graded rating of the automatic overcurrent device at um, 200 amps. And the copper gauge should be number six. And the, um, wait a second, I'm going to look at the right table. Hold on, I think I want one for grounding electrode conductors, which would be one less than that. Hold on. Yeah. What's that? 25066. Two fifty sixty six. That's where I should be. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay. Two fifty dot sixty six. Thank you so much. That's the that's the chart I was looking at. The grounding electrode conductor, not the equipment grounding conductor. Uh, so there you have it. That easy to put yourself into the wrong section of the code book. Thank you. So table on, in the Mike Holt book, this question would be answered or explained more fully on page eighty two. That's where you have table 250 at 66. In the code book, um, that table appears on page 115. So you're going to have the Mike Holt book to study from, but you've got to be able to, anytime you're working through his book, work through it with the code book open at the same page. 
because you will have the code book in the exam. You will not have his book. So uh, I, I, I sat next to a gentleman in the test I took who studied using the handbook. And um, when he got to the test, they gave him the code book. Things that he expected to see and remembered reading in the handbook were not in the code book the same way. And he had a very difficult time. I sat and watched him flip pages for hours trying to find things. So this is a good example of that. Okay. So um, in this case, if it's a two-aught wire, the correct answer for the grounding electroconductor would be four gauge. Okay. So that answer is here. And because we are talking about the grounding electrode conductor, not the equipment grounding conductor, table 250.66 is what applies. Okay? All right. Thank you for the correction. No problem. <laughs> um, okay. Copy. Search a new slide. Okay, uh, I, I put this one in here because of the, the work I've done during labs and such with electricians and some of the things I've actually seen in the field uh, where there may be, um, you know, people trying to tie in um, grounding electrode conductors coming from the inverter uh, or coming from another grounding electrode from one side to the next. There used to be in the 208 code, if it was further than six feet apart, you had to run a separate grounding electrode conductor and a separate grounding electrode, and then you had to bond those two together. So you've got one coming down from the main service panel, and you've got another one coming over from another grounding electrode. And it was often that I saw people uh, taking those acorns that attached to the grounding electrode and stuffing more than one grounding electrode conductor into that fitting. And so just to uh, reference that in the code, um, I wanted to make sure you guys knew that uh, you need, you're not allowed to do that. The maximum number of conductors permitted per grounding electrode conductor fitting is only one. Okay? So, um, you know, so lots of issues at you that uh, people in the field double lug things. I've seen double lugging in places in terminals. I've seen double lugging in, uh, in, in panel boards. I've seen um, double lugging in, in um, Polaris lugs. I've seen them in grounding, you know, um, lugs. And uh, that is not code compliant. In the field, it gets an installation to where you can, you know, test it. I've seen guys do that. Um, and then, you know, say they're going to come back and, and fix that at another breaker, at another, uh, you know, grounding lug or some other three, get, go and get that three, um, three slot Polaris lug or whatever, and, and then, and then they never do it. And, um, it's something that is a big, big code violation to be, you know, sharing multiple terminals. And that is not code compliant. And it's not code compliant either when it comes to grounding electrode conductors, uh, even if you've seen it in the field. This is where guys that have a lot of experience I mean, they're on this test because they've been out in the field doing 150, 200 installs, master electricians, journeymen that do this stuff and um, uh, don't, um, and they say that it's fine and, you know, they get into a test and they remember what they've seen, just like treating the wound and sending the guy back to work, um, and they don't really understand that that's not the proper thing to do. So, um I wanted to put a question in there that it is about that. Okay. What was that code um, reference? Uh, I found that last night in the NEC book, and it's uh, on grounding electrode fittings. Let me see if I can find that again. I was using multiple books of his, and I'm sure it's somewhere here in um, Article 250. but I didn't actually, okay. Without reading each one of these, I'm, you know, I'm in the article, um, deals with grounding electrodes, 
grounding electrode conductors in Article 250.62 and 64, page 113 in the code book. And somewhere, I'm guessing, in here there's going to be a uh, reference to the fittings. And I will get back to you on where exactly that is. Um, I apologize, I don't have the exact code reference on here. I, sh I should have done that. Um, but it's somewhere in that area. It was a, in Michael's bonding and grounding book is where I think I found that. And I thought that was interesting. I've seen people do that in the field several times. Okay, in the Mike Holt book for solar, it's on page 83 at the top. It's referenced in Article 250.70. It says, grounding electrode conductor termination fittings. The grounding electrode conductor must terminate to the grounding electrode by exochemical welding, listed lugs, listed pressure connectors, clamps, or other listed needs. In addition, fittings terminating to a grounding electrode must be listed for the materials of the grounding electrode. When the termination to a grounding electrode is encased in concrete or buried in the earth, Termination fitting must be listed for direct burial or concrete encasement. No more than one conductor can terminate on a single clamp or fitting unless the clamp or fitting is listed for multiple connections. So, unless it's listed, okay, and that would be something you need to check um, uh, with the listing. But it does say, so there may be an exception to that, and probably I should update that in my question. Um, say that unless it's listed otherwise, would only uh, accommodate one conductor per fitting. So I'll go back and fix the question to that, say that. Um, okay. Unless otherwise listed, okay, what is the maximum number of conductors permitting on a fitting? And that would be one. Okay. Now we'll go on to number nine. Okay. Hey, six, now. All right. Copy and paste. All right. Okay. PV array is a solid that has 100 feet, has a 100 foot width of a sloped barn roof. So it's a big, long, wide install going all the way down the side of this sloped roof building, hopefully facing the sun. The installer uses 20 foot lengths of mounting rails spliced together. So if you order a unirack or a lot of these uh, uh, racking materials, that's how they typically come. In 20 foot lengths, you can order 6 foot lengths, 16 foot lengths, 20 foot lengths, 4 foot lengths, whatever. But if you're doing a big long run like that, probably you're going to be working with 20 foot lengths. Uh, how many ground lugs do we need to properly ground the mounting rails? Okay. Um, so you know you've got one mounting rail at the top all the way down and one mounting rail at the bottom all the way down. So according to the code, how many ground lugs would be needed? So uh, if you're using... Um, the proper attachment hardware for the spicing rails. Um, I don't believe the spicing rails require an extra ground lug on those actual splicing pieces. Um, but each individual 20-foot length does need its own ground lug. You cannot just ground one rail and because they're technically connected together through the splice bar, um, that is not considered a grounded, bonded connection. So you've got to... Um, have a separate ground lug on each one of those 20-foot lengths. So you've got a rail at the top with five pieces. You've got a rail at the bottom with five pieces. 
So in counting out POS stuff to go out there that day just for that mounting hardware, in addition to each of the modules if you're going to use ground lugs and any other metallic um, elements that are part of your installation, uh, you're supposed to have a ground lug on each one of them. So wouldn't this be two, one for each rail, top and bottom? It wouldn't be five because you have two rails, the top one and the bottom one. Um, it would be ten. Now, now uh, depending on the authority having jurisdiction, if they interpret that those splice bars in between the rails also need ground lugs, okay? Um, they're, and depending on how those splices are attached between the metallic, I mean, the, the actual uh, length of rail, um, you might actually need ground lugs on those splice connectors as well. So that's something to verify with the AHJ. And because technically that is a separate piece of metal and could technically be considered separate from the rails themselves. So if you've got five pieces on the top and five pieces on the bottom with four splice kits in between, that would be 10 plus four on the top and four at the bottom or 18. So again, this is one of those questions that it depends. Oh boy, what font am I in now? Um, okay, depends on the authority having jurisdiction, whether they count those splice bars um, as or not. Okay. And any questions there? Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. On that question there? I guess for uh, the number seven, you didn't size it according to 250.166 um, for DC grounding electrode sizing. You sized you size it based on the AC. Why was that? Okay, let me see that. I'm going to, oops, right, copy this last one over and I'll come right to your question. Okay, back up to problem seven. Um, Well, the PD output circuit is DC, okay? So uh, if you're, I guess, is there, where, where are you seeing that there's a, a separate listing for DC? Um, article 250.166, uh, size 166. of the direct current. Yeah, 166, right. Okay. Um, I put two off because it because it says on B of that says where the DC system, uh, the electrode conductor shall not be smaller than the largest conductor supplied by the system. Shall not be smaller than the largest conductor. Right, because this 250.166 is size of the direct current grounding electrode conductor, whereas 250.66 is for AC grounding uh, electroconductors. And we are on the DC side. Right. Okay. So in letter B, not smaller than the grounding electroconductor must not be smaller than the largest ungrounded conductor supplied by the DC system, not smaller than eight gauge. So if it is two aught, it would have to be two aught. You are correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there, are, there are, no, that's great. I'm, uh, Thanks, I need to highlight to check something too. out. Do 
PC systems, part eight. Very, very good. Okay. So depending on where you are in the circuit, if I was coming out of the inverter, you know, coming um, out of the inverter or between the AC disconnect and the main panel where that's on the AC side, um, then my other answer would have been correct. If I'm coming out of the PV output circuit, which is absolutely on the DC side, um, and I had a um, uh, two-watt output circuit conductor, and I was, you know, running that down to an equipment grounding conductor, perhaps uh, on a ground mount system that's far away, where you have to have a separate grounding electrode conductor out on that ground mount, or a pole mount system, um, absolutely under a direct current situation, part eight, uh, table 250.166 is what applies. Thank you. Okay. 10 gauge conductors have been chosen as a properly sized conductor based on the expected, on the current expected from a PV alpha circuit for the ungrounded conductors. Uh, this actually came up in Mike Holt's lecture, and when we were looking at this yesterday, we found where this actually does have um, a, uh, a rule. And you know what? I don't remember where I found it, but um, when you're sizing wire, uh, for the neutral or the uh, grounded conductor, um, you absolutely must use the same gauge wire that you're using on the current carrying ungrounded conductors. So um, the proper answer here would be uh, people see this grounded conductor, and if you're, what color would it be, thinking that that's the grounding conductor? Um, and, you know, that, that might be the six-gauge green that goes inside the circuit or six-gauge bare wire, right? So we, we know about that one. Um, and so they do look at ground ed and they see ground ing. It's easy to get this one mistaken. But when you're talking about the grounded conductor, it must be white. And if the conductors on the circuit are 10-gauge um, conductors, then it must match that. Okay, um, and so that's what you size, even though that may not be carrying, um, you know, current. And the example Mike was talking about was on the AC side where the neutral was probably not carrying current. He was saying, you know, you know under normal circumstances, I don't think that has to be the same size, but um, it does. It has to be the same size as the uh, live um, conductors, and we found that in the code book. Okay. So um, these are the 10 that kind of get you into looking through the code book. You can see from what happened to me with problem number seven that even when you're reading through these things and you're, you know, studying this stuff, uh, Article 200 deals with so many important areas, um, starting, you know, with um, Article uh, 210. which gets into um, sorry, Article 230, which gets into uh, installation requirements for service conductors and equipment. Uh, that's, you know, knowing what different conduits are, knowing the, 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 how you're allowed to uh, put all that together over current, over current protection. There are just um, all kinds of, getting back to Article um, 230 for just a second, um, really do need to spend some time with Article 230 if you haven't done a lot of work in choosing the right kind of conduit and understanding where the answers are in here. You will get this book, uh, but you need to know where to look something up related to conduit and related to um, the, the rules surrounding different uh, installation requirements for raceway in different situations. So know what to hear. No, it's not here. The mounting support, I believe, um, is Article 230.51. I had somebody ask me about that. Um, so, Article 30 says you have the one that uh, service interest cables shall be supported by straps or other approved means within 312 inches from every service head and then 30 inches in intervals not exceeding 30 inches in between. So the answer, found it now, is uh, 230.51 for the um, question I have on the chat here. What is the chart? And that's where it shows up. 
Um, also, Table 3, 230.51c also talks about supports. So that's where that is. Uh, okay. So within our Article 230, there's rules with respect to disconnects, you know, knowing, knowing the maximum number of disconnects. Um, this, this has definitely been on there. I want to call your attention in the code book to page 230.56, which is 70-84. Um, let's see if I can bring that back up, my code book here. Uh, what page I'm on. In the 300 years, so I want to be at actually I'll just pages on the PDF aren't the same. So 230.50.71. I need this book. Gonna take a minute to come around. No matches. Interesting. All right, well, let's go back to it. I'm going to find it myself. Page 140, so I'm four pages off. Let's see what we need. This is about a page. Okay. Wanted to call your attention to Hey, Garrett. Um, Come here, Garrett. Good. You want to learn about electrical? Very um, interesting. Um, this is the code book. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to show was 230, 71, 3R. Okay, page 87 on my PDF. The service disconnect needs for each service permitted by 230.2 for each of the set service conductors, blah, 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 section number one, not more than six switches or sets of circuit spacers or a combination of not more than six switches or circuit spacers mounted on a single enclosure in a group of enclosures or on a switchboard. And that, so this, this is important for um, disconnecting a solar system. You have, uh, you may want to, may have a, a, a breaker in yeah. the combiner box. Yeah. You may have a breaker in the disconnect. You have another br disconnect in the, um, that might come with the actual yeah. inverter. And you've got the AC disconnect on the inverter and the AC disconnect coming out the inverter. You start looking at all the different um, disconnecting means. You have to make sure at the end of the day that it does not add up to more than six. Okay? That's important. I've seen that one on the exam. Um, yeah, how many disconnects you have in order to figure out what wires you need. Okay. So uh, do spend some time and know what is in uh, lightning arresters. So surge arresters are yeah, called in accordance with the requirements of Article 280. Should they committed on ungrounded over service, you know, who's there. Um, there's different, make sure you, they can give you a situation on whether or not a disconnect is considered to be readily accessible. So that's something that in Article 230, 205, a couple of pages down, is a new uh, requirement. Is spelled out more clearly on page 88 in the code book. Um, I'm ahead of it. Yeah, where are you at now? 
Somebody's going to need to mute somebody here. Why are you out there? I can't really tell who that is. Oh, Sid, you're supposed to be wearing your electronics. All right, Clayton, I'm going to have to mute you. Electrical. Oh, How do I do it? Why turn a little bit over? Clayton and mute. Sorry, Clayton. Okay. All right. Sorry for the rest of you. That, that was a little distracting. Um, it is Sunday. Let's go, babe. What do you like to eat? Okay. All right. So... Huh? This word says, is this kitchen needs to be operated by a mechanical engine from readily accessible. Um, so the second floor is okay. Um, it just can't be something that requires something to be taken apart or something to be climbed over or something that will restrict somebody from getting to where they can actually disconnect. Okay? Starting in Article 240 is where you get into overcurrent protection. So remember our chapters one through um, chapters one through uh, four are general situations, and so uh, what I wanted to do was kind of get you into these areas of the code book that you may or may not have ventured into yet, and know that there's nothing to be afraid of, and that um, uh, you need to be able to familiarize yourself with where you find things in these sections. So 240 is where you're going to find things on overcurrent protection. Um, this gives you some of the uh, breakdown. Remember there was something about the sizing of individual fuses. When you're sizing in a combiner box and each string is coming in, landing on its own positive um, fuse holder, anytime you have more than um, two incoming strings, then that those uh, incoming strings have to be fused in the combiner box. And depending on the um, amperage rating of the string, again, it's before you get any power conditioning unit, so you are, it would be subject to a radiant spike, and it would be running for longer than three hours. So when you're sizing the fuses in, those combi in that combiner box, um, it would be whatever the amperage rating is of that string. Let's say it's 7.8 times 1.25 for the irradiance spike times 1.25 for continuous duty comes out to a, uh, an amperage rating of 12.18. Um, so the minimum size fuse that you'd have to have in, in um, that fuse holder, here's what they come in, okay? So they come in ratings of this, – this is in standard circuit breakers, but in these little fuses, they usually come up – come in one amp increments up to 15. So a 12 amp fuse would not work. Here we go. And then that's just little fuses. These are the standard sizes. Um, Easier in Article 240. <sighs> so if it can't be 12 amp fuse, it would have to be a 13 amp fuse. And I'm finding where this that they come up. I know it's in here. Um, 
And then, of course, you have the other ones. We'll keep going down here. Okay. <laughs> ah, not finding it. Um, but let's say, you know, depending on the, the, you just need to know that you take the, String amperage rating, multiply it by, and then you would upside it to the next, by 1.25, then 1.25, and you upside it to the next greatest um, fuse that would go in those fuse holders. All right. Um, Always a tricky one to find. I need it. two soldiers so another thing to note while we're on the subject is you cannot use those fuse holders as a breaker. Um, that is not an acceptable way to open for maintenance. Okay. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, Hopefully I'll come across that one. And it wants to know. Okay, so Article 240 deals with overcurrent protection, and uh, uh, these are some of those accessibility issues. So not shall be ready access will be installed so that the center of the grip of the operating handle or circuit, when it's in its highest position, is not more than 2.0 meters, which is six foot seven inches above the floor or working platform, unless one of the following applies. So they could give you this one. This is where that readily accessible. Each occupant may have ready access to overcurrent devices. So uh, again, this is the some of the you know they may get into. Where would you find information dealing with overcurrent devices? What does it mean to be protected from physical damage? What does it mean in terms of damp and wet locations? Um, and then that 312.2 would be um, how you comply with those wet and damp locations. You have to look to that table. They can be mounted, they must be mounted in a vertical position unless that is shown to be impractical. And then sometimes that requires a special permission depending um, on what, what's allowable there in 240, where it's in accordance with 240.81. So then you have to look at what 240.81 says to know whether um, you're complying with that. And then based on the question, that could be something that they do. But um, I 
thought I was getting closer to where those little fuses are listed in terms of being one amp apart, uh, but I cartridge fuses not seeing where that is for me in here. All right. Um, Article 250 gets into grounding, and I do know that Janet Hughes is set to provide um, a lot of information on grounding, and uh, so I'm going to I'm not going to cover that too much. What I want to do in um, the little bit of time I have left today is uh, move into Article 690 and show you some of the new things there that I know the things that I saw on my version of the exam that I want to make sure are things you can find quickly. Taking me through all the wires. Bring back to that one. So that's us say. The not full of all day existence. What are you talking about here? 340. UF cable shall be committed as follows. Okay, let's see what Article 690.31 says. Let me get there. Um, I do know there's a chart in Article 300 that came up that I definitely had to spend some time on during the exam. And that was the one that deals with all the different insulation types. Um, I want to call your attention to that before I jump all the way out of this first couple of chapters here. Okay. Table. 310.104, which is on page 168 in the code book, and probably like 170 in my PDF. Um, okay. There will be some call during the exam to be able to understand how to look and read this table. Um, get away from these... Uh, Okay, so it gives you the different maximum um, operating temperatures for different insulation types. So they could give you something along those lines. Um, they'll give you the trade name, the different things for the insulation, and then where, what type of conditions they are, uh, the outer covering. So um, these are all the conductors rated uh, and insulations rated for 600 volts, which would... Um, it explains, so depending on the size of the cabling, um, moisture-resistant cables, um, what these different things mean. So thermoset, RHH, is good up to 90 degrees Celsius in damp and uh, dry and damp locations. And then these are the sizes, um, flame retardant, non-metallic covering. So uh, the know how to look this table to check out a, 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 an insulation rating that they give you. What that dash two means usually is that it's um, good for a 90 degree rating um, or wet locations. Um, and then you have uh, silicon. And one thing I thought was interesting in here was that um, Ratings on what is most commonly used in the field is THHN, so the TE stands for thermoplastic. Um, the uh, H, each one of these things as a, uh, stands for I think, heat resistance. Um, w for wet and uh, flame. So this tells you what the uh, different cables are. And there was one that dealt with um, power cables. It was on the test. So the difference between R and X 
W X H H and X H H W two. Uh, there's a fine print note in in the in Article three ten that is still there. Uh, on, right at the top of this page. Whoops. And I um, I've mentioned this to uh, electricians who never caught this one. Got myself back in the pages here. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. It says, we all use, in lots of examples you see in this, um, informational note. Thermoplastic insulation may stiffen at temperatures lower than 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and it may also be deformed at normal temperatures, temperatures or subject to pressure such as points of support. Thermoplastic insulations where used on DC circuits in wet location may result in endo electroendosmosis between conductor and insulation. So where we're using THHN coming out of the junction box to a combiner box in a wet location, uh, endo electroendosmosis, I Googled it, and basically it means breakdown in the, in the insulation. So technically, um, if that's the case, any of these thermoplastic cables should not really be used on the DC side. And when you look at what we typically use, um, I've, I've seen tons of articles by John Wiles and other people that mention, you know, wire sizing, and they're talking about using um, THHN cable. And um, really what they ought to be using is either RHW, RH, or um, for moisture and wet, dye and damp locations, um, not, not damp and wet locations, excuse me, on the DC side, they really ought to be using not the thermoplastic, but the thermoset, uh, which is the XHH or XHHW. Uh, I don't know. You read that fine print note. It's not um, a requirement. Just an information note, and uh, THHN and THWN are the most common wires that people carry. Uh, but on the DC side, if you adhere to that informational note, um, maybe that shouldn't be used. Uh, but there's, as you go down, it lists like what is used for, uh, like uh, power cables. The question that I had. Um, was was dealt with that. Which is the best kind to use on power cables? And it dealt with the insulation that you needed it to have according to that table. So um, definitely would have to be resistant and um, plain retardant would be a good thing. Um, tool wiring and uh, in wet locations so you got to read know how to read that uh, to know whether it would be appropriate okay so I just want to call your attention to that table as well that came up all right on to article 690 so the table, the table that deals with um, Insulation is in chapter three, section three ten, table three ten dot one oh four. Hopefully we're getting into part of the now. Okay. So uh I'm sure that most of you at this point have gotten really familiar with this. My point of what I want to do here, not to Start diving into Article 690 like you've never seen it before. Um, but just know one thing. Uh, there's a great diagram when you get questions on source circuits, output circuits, blocking diodes, bypass diodes. Right in the beginning of this section of the code book, some of these things are defined for you right there, as well as in Article 100. So don't let questions like that stop you. They do sometimes come up, and there are places in the code book where you can get those definitions. Um, Charge controllers, equipment, um, versionary charge controller, that's something that would have to have a load to take any excess 
and that diverts um, in a direct current system. Uh, hybrid, understand the difference in hybrid and bipolar. Hybrid means you've got multiple generating sources, more original generation from wind, solar, micro hydro, uh, generator, you know, diesel or propane generator. Um, in order to accommodate multiple inputting original generation sources, that's a hybrid system. Bimodal means really secondary storage, storage coming from a power plant through the utility grid to you. So they're not generating it over there. You're pull, they're generating it, but you're pulling it in through the utility, so you're getting it as a secondary source. Batteries, they don't, batteries do not generate power. They store power. If your system pulls from either the grid or a battery bank, it's bimodal, and that battery is charged by a primary source, but the battery itself is not capable of charging itself by itself. It's a secondary source of power into your system. So that would be bimodal. Okay, um, uh, locking diode and um, bypass diode, there's a difference there. Difference between a module and a panel, technical, but uh, the difference between a PV input source circuit and output circuit. Um, the array itself is the source of power. The sun's landing on the array. So the cables coming from the array into the combiner box, they are bringing that power from its source, source circuits. If you had to think of it, you would have called it that. Um, so the photovoltaic system voltage um, is the direct current of any photovoltaic source or photovoltaic output circuit. For multi-wire installations, it's the highest voltage between any two DC conductors. Okay, so uh, that when they talk about what's the system voltage, that's just what you have. The maximum system voltage takes what that is and applies any temperature corrections to it. Um, all right. So just understanding in the question how you do those. Uh, an article in, um, tells you uh, where conductors of more than one TV system occupy the same junction box. They must be grouped separately by wire tires, wire ties, or similar means at least once, and then be grouped at intervals not to exceed six feet. Okay, so uh, in old, this is new with this 2011 code that was not in there before. You could take multiple systems and turn them into the same, and I've seen giant, you know, utility scale wiring um, things where it's all just grouped together as one big bunch tied together with tie wraps. Um, and also remember that when you, t you know, even if that's in free air, uh, that can be code violation if the ones on the inside of that bundle really can't be considered in free air anymore. And there's, I got into a discussion about an electrician on, on how you would um, size those conductors if they're going to be clumped together, even though they may not be a conduit. Uh, where do you draw the line between whether they're in free air or they're actually, you know, exposed to, to heat elements? and heating up beyond what you might think because they're in the center of a clump. So there's, we're going to probably see some guidance about that in code corner articles and things coming up. And that's something that people are starting to think about in these big installations. Um, so, uh, okay, the things that are added here. Um, where things can be routed. Okay, so photovoltaic source and output conductors in and out of conduit and inside of a building shall be routed along a building or structural members, such as beams, rafters, trusses, or columns, where the location of those structural members can be determined by observation. Where circuits are embedded in built-up laminate or membrane roofing materials um, in roof areas not covered by PV modules and associated equipment, the location of the circuits shall be clearly marked. This is new. This means you've got a label on the outside of the conduit if that conduit contains TV cable. That was not the case. And you should do that as a, as a distance with which you're supposed to make those identifications. And I believe um, I'm somewhere in the code book it says where those should be, how often those, that label should be. And we'll come back that in a second. Um, Bipolar systems is another thing. There's, co there's information here about bipolar systems. I'm not an expert on that area. I do remember that uh, there was a question about that. And it wasn't a very complicated question, but it was 
dealt with maximum system voltage of a bipolar system being the absolute sum of the absolute value of the negative side and the positive side, and then if that is under certain temperature situations, uh, corrected for temperature. I don't want to get into that right now, but so there are different kinds of bipolar systems, and uh, I think it's, unless it's otherwise specified, that was one of the questions in the study guide that you should kind of look at. Um, so uh, ground fault protection, um, grounded DC, photovoltaic rays should be provided with DC ground fault protection, meeting the requirements of 690.5 A through C. Our fire hydrants, ungrounded PV system shells comply with 690.35. Exception. Um, if they're isolated from the building, they can have be permitted without that. And uh, for a installed it other than dwelling units shall be permitted without ground fault protection if each equipment grounding conductor is in accordance with 690.45. So look at that. Okay. So we've been over many, many times uh, what, you know, this, this whole thing on um, temperature correction, so I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. This is the table Richard was going over yesterday. And really, um, my take on temperature correction that might make it simpler uh, is this. Um, you know, in every other form of electrical equipment, when you look at what it's rated to produce, it says it's X number of watts, plugs into the wall in an outlet, it's a 120 volt. So watts divided by volts gives you amps, right? Very simple way to calculate all those circuits. Um, and, you know, you, and any piece of electrical gear is rated, and, and when the power comes in over the power line, plus or minus two volts one way or the other, depending on where you are, you know, in that uh, grid, your, your, your voltage is pretty much constant. And so, um, uh, and same, same with the amperage, based on what the piece of electronic equipment needs. So in the regular world of electrical, uh, things are very predictable in terms of their watts, voltage, and amperage characteristics. With solar, um, they chose these things they called standard test conditions at 25 degrees Celsius and 1,000 watts per meter squared for um, defining the voltage, rated voltage, and the rated amperage. And those are not really magic numbers. Uh, 25 degrees Celsius equates to about 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the normal temperature at which most people are comfortable. 1,000 amps, I'm sorry, 1,000 watts per meter squared is the uh, intensity of sunlight at noon on average in most places on Earth. That's where they got those two numbers, and they are not magic numbers. They are just the numbers that they chose so that then everybody could use the same conditions when they make PV equipment. So anytime a PV system is installed in conditions which are going to go outside of those two determining factors, temperature and intensity of light, they're going to change what they output. And so the question you need to ask yourself then is, well, if they're going to change by how much, right? And so to answer that, you just think about, well, what is the change in temperature? So when you look at that calculation that's out there for um, temperature correction, it says, okay, take the maximum voltage, worst case scenario you could ever see under an open circuit condition, VOC, because that's the end of the ID curve, and uh, no matter where you are in terms of resistance, that's the highest voltage you could ever see because that's actually the voltage where you have no current flowing at all. So if I'm given two voltage characteristics, the operating voltage, VMP and VOC, and I want to compute a worst case scenario, I'm of course going to choose VOC because I'm trying to take what is my highest voltage I'm given in the module spec and add some kind of correction to it or add her based on some other temperature that I might see lower than 25 degrees Celsius. So when I have to pick which one to use to input into that formula, of course I want the higher of the two, because what I'm about to do is calculate an adder that's going to make that VOC even higher, because when temperatures go down, voltage goes up. And then the rest of that calculation is just like, okay, so by how much? Sometimes you're given temperature correction as a percentage of the VOC per degree Celsius. So if I can 
look at my VOC and it's say 0.035%, if I multiply that times that, and then I use that little adder for every degree Celsius difference than I am from that rated 25 degrees, that's going to tell me how much I need to add, right? Sometimes you're given it as an actual number of volts or millivolts per degree Celsius. That makes it even easier because now you actually know, you know, how many millivolts you need to calculate based on the difference between that rated 25 degrees Celsius and that expected low. So don't get too bent out of shape about that calculation. Think about what you're doing. You're adjusting the expected output based on environmental conditions and using the manufacturer's rated adjustment factor, that temperature correction factor, you're just plugging it in and basing that off your worst case scenario, highest voltage you could ever see, VOC, and then calculating an adder that's going to add per module, and then you multiply that by the number of modules in the string. It's, your, it's that by how much, right? So that's all you're doing with that formula. And when you sit down and break it down, don't try to memorize the formula. Think about what you're doing, and you won't, you won't have to memorize it because it makes sense what you would plug in, why you would plug it in, and what those different things mean. Look at your unit. Is it in millivolts per degree Celsius, or is it in percent V per degree Celsius? That percent V means a certain percentage of the VOC per degree Celsius. And then, boom, just plug it into the formula. So I, for a long time, that was, you know, this is the difference between memorizing and learning. Once you understand what that calculation means, they can never stump you. Okay? All right. Um, getting on to um, 690.8, calculating the max current. So what does max current mean? It means that they chose 1,000 watts per meter squared when they said that module was going to put out 7.83 amps. Right? That's what they said. Um, and it says right there under the label, this is at an irradiance of 1,000 watts per meter squared. Okay? Well, that's not some magic number um, that is the maximum, even though we call that a peak sun hour. Uh, there's a very good likelihood that you could see irradiance spikes beyond that. I, I was in San Antonio doing a class where it was rained all morning, and we came out at noon to do a lab, and uh, the sun just came out beyond the clouds, and it was summertime, and it was hot, and between, um, you know, the uh, intensity of the heat, on the ground, evaporating, and the sun coming around behind the clouds. I held up my pyrometer, and I saw with my very own eyes an irradiance reading of 1,260. At that given moment, because of the radiance spike and the moisture and the water molecules in the air that were intensifying the, uh, the light um, coming into my pyrometer, whatever the module was saying, 7.83, if I put that module facing directly at the sun right there, at the same orientation as my pyrometer, I need to multiply whatever <coughs> rated voltage is by 1.26 to see what it would actually be giving me. So when the, when the code says, what's the maximum circuit current you could get? They want to know in the, in the worst case scenario, what is the maximum current on that module? It's not what it's rated at. It's what it's rated at times what the code is happy with saying a, a, um, a maximum current and right there under number one shall be the sum of the parallel module rated short circuit currents multiplied by 125%, okay, period. That is max current. Under normal circumstances, if that system is only turned on for 10 minutes, or underneath that three-hour continuous duty, let's say it turned on for those 10 minutes when I had that pyronometer at 1260, right, I could easily see more than the rated current. And the maximum would be, according to the code, they're happy with 1.25 or 125%. Okay? So anywhere in that circuit where the modules are out there and they have their rated voltage and it's a good chance that they could be subject to an irradiance spike, whether it's the module wiring, the junction box, the disconnect, the combiner box, anything up to any side on the DC where there's nothing to control that irradiance spike. Okay, you've got to figure in that a radiance spike of 125% because at any moment, any given moment in time, that tax current could be established from some conditions causing the intensity of the light to exceed well beyond that 1,000 watts per meter squared. Now, 
if you're sizing wire that's going to be carrying current or overcurrent protection that needs to function properly for longer than three hours, because that's what's going to be out there, that's where that extra 125% comes from. But when you look what it says, calculation of max current, maximum current for a specific circuit shall be calculated in accordance with 690.8A1 through A4, which says, uh, where the requirements of 690.8A1, which is that first irradiance spike, and B1, hmm, what does B1 say? Um, not to carry this, continuous duty, okay, there's that one there, okay, um, that B1 deals with that shall be con photovoltaic system current shall be considered to be continuous. Boom. So that second 125% has to do with that. And so, you know, I think this was written, this, this code edition, talking about, um, whoops. Oh, where am I now? I think this code edition here in 690.8 um, A1, where that, that little thing was I just saw. Okay, right there. But information note, I think that information note was added to help the teachers that teach that difference between um, sometimes you use 1.25, sometimes you use 1.56, and, and I don't teach it that way. I teach it, where are you in the system and are you subject to an irradiant spike, yes or no? That's max current. Then, will you be subject to that current operating longer than three hours? That's the second 125%. And by separating out the two, you you'll won't ever put the wrong multiplier in the wrong place. Okay. Um, so that's max current. And on the labeling, um, they're looking for instantaneous numbers, okay, where they're requiring you to indicate four things. What's the rated current on this system? What's the rated voltage? That's from the minute you power it on, no irradiance, boom, what's it rated at according to the label on the system? But then when they say max current and uh, max system voltage, that's where they want the um, temperature corrected or, or potentially the radiance affected um, numbers listed there. Okay. Ah, here it is. Right here. I found it. It wasn't in Article 300. It was here. I wonder if we get to my ultimate 10. Okay. Photovoltaic source circuits. Boom. Ran circuits with supplementary type overcurrent devices shall be permitted to provide overcurrent protection in photovoltaic source circuits. Um, they shall be accessible but shall not be required to be readily accessible. Standard values of supplementary overcurrent allowed by this section shall be in one ampere increments starting at one up to 15. So where I did that calculation before, where we had a 7.8 amp um, ISC times 1.25 times 1.25, and I came out with 12.18 amps in that finger fuse, okay? That's where um, I would have had to gone up to the 13 amp mini fuse in those uh, combiner box fuse holders, okay? So this is where it is. And boy, you can look forever in Article 240 for where you'd find what that increment can be. And if all you look for is Article um, 240 for thinking about what size um, uh, fuse should be in those combiner boxes, you would miss that there actually is such a thing as a 13 amp mini fuse that would go in those combiner box fuse holders. And it's not in um, higher standard values above 15 for supplementary overcurrent devices shall be based on the standard sizes provided in 246A, which is where I was stuck. So sorry for wasting your time. I knew somewhere in the code book it said that these other ones were available. You can expect a question on this because electricians, when they talk about overcurrent, they go right to Article 240 and don't realize that right here in this subsection here of a special circumstance, Chapter 6 overrules what the general requirements are in Chapters 1 through 4, Boom, here are those overcurrent rated 
um, devices that are in that combiner box. Okay? Cool. I found it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So moving right along. It's amazing what can get somebody you know, excited. Again, I, I personally love getting back into the code book, getting ready for this because um, so many little things in here to know. And once you really know where things are and know that there's things in there to it gets me, got me there. I knew there was somewhere in the book where that was. And this is what loses time in the test. It wasn't where I thought it was. And uh, that's where you sometimes have to really know the book. If it's not in 240, where would it be? You know, try to go back. Okay. Um, this is where we talk about... Um, Multi-wire branch circuits. You can, easy, this is why uh, this is particularly comes into play when you've got off-grid systems where you have a 120 volt inverter and you're supplying loads to a um, branch, multi-wire branch circuit. This is a, a home, the builder didn't know you were going to take this home off the grid necessarily. And so the electrician came in the way they always do and had multi-drops on the same branch circuit, now you have a uh, problem. So if that's the case, um, you cannot supply single 120 volt um, inverter on that branch circuit because that's going to overload the neutral in that circuit. Okay? So um, you got to make sure that it doesn't get wired that way or you will be in violation of this law here. And there's where it's described. Not law, but this section and article. Okay, all right, moving right along. Um, so many cool things in here. Backfed circuit breakers, okay. Um, they could give you a situation. Full of it, the DC source circuits, DC output circuits are both for penetrating a building at a PV system max voltage of 80 volts or greater shall be protected. Um, by enlisted DC arc fault circuit interrupter. This is new to the code. This is this whole deal that Rebecca Wren writes about so well in her article that came out in um, Solar Pro that I put on the reading list about uh, that came out last year on um, code changes to the, to the 2011 code. She and uh, wrote an awesome, awesome article that talks about arc fault protection along with somebody else, and uh, this is where they're talking about that. So they could give you a certain number of modules in a string, okay, where maybe the rated module voltage, um, say it's a 24-volt 20, system that's got a uh, um, module, two 24-volt nominal modules that have a VOC of 42 volts. Um, the PV uh, maximum system voltage on that um, could definitely exceed 80 volts at which point, yes, our fault protection would be required, okay? Someone asked me a question here on temperature correction. Is there a common temperature coefficient if it's not labeled on the module? Yes. Um, if the temperature coefficient is not labeled, you could assume it to be 0.05% of the VOC per degree Celsius. Um, I know that's what's typically used when you're calculating for high temperatures when it's not really listed. Um, and uh, that would be one to use. But the way the code says, okay, um, if, if you don't have a temperature coefficient, you're supposed to use the VOC times that table value in 690.7. You're not supposed to correct for low temperatures using some um, common, you know, temperature coefficient. So, don't fall into that trap. If, if you're having a module, it's an older module, and it doesn't, and you can't find, or it just doesn't provide in the manufacturer specs an actual temperature coefficient, you only use a temperature coefficient if it's given to you. If it isn't given to you, you use the table, and then you use the uh, either the um, ash ray low temperature expected, the ash ray tables, or you use the record load depending on the authority having jurisdiction. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's see if I'm skipping anything up here. 
your DC, uh, your disconnecting devices must be DC rated, which means they have to handle up to 600 volts. Uh, this is almost always the case when you go for DC, and, and people know this when they're sizing their DC system, um, and, and, and it has to be rated for DC up to 600, not AC. Um, same with all the overcurrent protection. Okay. Uh, moving through here. All right. Readily accessible overcurrent protection. Photovoltaic systems may not be installed in the bathroom. Believe it or not, that was on mine. So this is that. Um, here we go. We're getting to 690.31. we got to remember to do that related to a couple of things. So installed in a red, either outside of a building or structure or inside the nearest point of entrance of the system conductors. Um, they can have it located remote from the point of entry, but it cannot be installed in a bathroom. Period. Um, each photovoltaic system disconnecting means permanently marked that it is, is being used as a PV system disconnect. And again, this is at no more than six switches. So here it is referenced twice. Um, can't be used with some other thing. OK. One or more disconnecting needs shall be provided in each combiner box where conductors are spliced or overcurrent protection is provided. This disconnecting means shall comply with following requirements. Located okay, where accessible. Lockable and externally operable, and adjacent to or integral with the combiner box. There's now several combiner boxes coming out with um, disconnects and uh, uh, breakers inside, which is great. I've even seen some where they actually have T um, MC4 connectors, so you don't even have to wire the inside of the combiner box, which is cool. So I am over the time we had allotted for this um, by a little bit here, it's 5.13. Um, I'm just going to keep flowing through chapter, uh, 690 here. If you had not planned on spending more time, please um, go ahead and jump off. We will be publishing this, and uh, we can look at that later if you want to. Um, OK. Ah, here's that part on flexible cords and cables. Um, we're moving parts, and this is why it's in there. So flexible cords or cables um, shall comply with Article 400 and shall be the type identified for hard service or portable power cable. So they may ask you what that is, which means you'd have to go to Article 400 and, and find one that meets these requirements. You'd have to find a particular cable that, had, that was rated for number one, um, power, portable power cable, because that's what this tracking device is considered, suitable for extra hard usage, Listed for outdoor use, water resistant, and sunlight resistant. And when you find one that matches all those things, then you look for the one on the answer that um, that it goes according to that. Okay. All right. So these are the temperature correction factors for cabling um, that comes right out. It's very similar to uh, 310 when it comes to temperature correction. So we're not going to get into that part um, today. Just trying to scroll through here in the last few seconds if there was anything that um, I wanted to mention. Uh, I know that um, there are things now that have been moved outside of Article uh, 690. Um, one of them deals with charge controllers. Um, and this one was on mine, so I want to go to that one real quick. Um, wait, is this it? So it gave an example of the charge controller. This is it here. All right, this was on my test. 
Okay, this article 690.72. So I want to make sure you know that this is there. Equipment shall be provided to um, control the charging process of the battery. It's not required where the design of the PV source circuit is matched to the voltage rating and the charge concurrent. Ah, I mess here. Is um, will not be required match the voltage rating and the charge control requirements of the interconnected battery cells and the maximum charging current multiplied by one hour is less than 3% of the rated battery capacity. So, for example, um, if you have a charge controller that um, it's a small charge controller, for example, on a solar gate, the reason that, the reason that I'm sorry, you have a, a, a PV panel, like a 5-watt module that's charging a 100-amp-hour battery on, say, a solar gate, the reason why you don't need a charge control in that situation is that the, um, the charging current of that 5-watt module, um, uh, which is 5 watts divided by 12 volts, um, would be, you know, very, let me see, 5 divided by 12 volts is about 0.416 amps. So if the battery is rated at 100 amp hour, that's why you don't need that 0.416 times 1 hour Okay, um, is 0.416 amp hours. That's definitely less than 3% of the battery's rated capacity. Um, and so, therefore, that's why you don't need a charge controller. So that's a very easy problem for them to set up. A particular size watt module that with a voltage, nominal voltage, and um, what amp hour the battery is, and then would or would you not need a charge controller in that situation, and that 3% is that threshold, Okay. That was one thing I definitely wanted to uh, cover today. And there was a question about that on my exam. Um, okay. Um, also, battery enclosures, definitely understand those parameters. Um, there will be questions related to that. Uh, it has to have, you know, what's a uh, disconnect, non-load break disconnect. Rate switch shall be permitted to use as a disconnect. You know, with the disconnect with the fuse needs to be rated at. Study that stuff. Um, and not really sure about this buck boost direct current converters. Something new added here. I might want to recommend you look at that. Battery cables. Okay, Article 400, as defined in Article 400, and sizes 2 watt gauge and larger shall be permitted within the battery closure from battery terminal to a nearby junction box if they're connected to an approved wiring method. So what is the minimum size? 2 watt. Okay. And um, then there are some, you know, codes of reference to systems over 600 volts where you would maybe see that on a, D, on a utility scale system. Okay, uh, just wanted to see what it was in Article 700 that I know I wanted to cover. Let's go to Article 705, it might have been dealing with um, qualified persons. Um, This is where um, Article 700 is definitely um, to know what's here and what's not here, as I don't right now. I um, apologize what I'm looking for, but just auxiliary power supplies when you have a generator involved. Okay. I don't know when I get to Article 705, and then I'm going to sign off. I think that's to do with auxiliary power. There you go. 
Okay. So here's where, um, okay. This deals with hybrid systems, um, supply side connections. So interconnected electric power production sources. So this is part of the code that is outside of 690. Okay, it's outside of Article Chapters 1 through 4, and there are a lot of things in Article 705 that you've got to know. So, in as much as you're familiar with Article 690, please do not avoid or uh, forget to be, know where things are and what is also here in Article 700. Okay? This is... Uh, Another whole set of codes that may apply in um, situations dealing with solar systems as they interconnected fly side tap or other things that for some reason are moved now outside of artificial design. And um, we've described in depth here in uh, Article 700. I know that Michael covers a lot of this as well. All right. So, uh, you can get a, I hope you can get an electronic version of the code book where you can even use like the highlighting tool to start highlighting things that you find that deal with things we've talked about today, things that you find in the Mike Holt book, um, some of the tables that we reviewed today. Um, one other thing I'm going to tell you about that's in there that I can guarantee in the new, one of the big changes, they used to have a question on torque settings that, um, that, is not, that was not the place where you would look for torque settings was in the manufacturer's literature or even things like um, uh, um, even things like um, terminals in disconnects, panel boards, uh, ratings on circuit breakers, um, inverters, uh, even torque settings on attachments for mounting hardware. Everything has a torque setting from the manufacturer in most cases, but in the absence of that, um, sometimes what would you do? There was nothing, and the code book didn't provide any guidance. So now there is a recommended tightening torque table from UL Standard 46AB that can be used, and this is a new addition to the uh, 2011 code book. So depending on what your, you know, what wire test conductor installed with, say, 8-gauge wire in a slot, say, in a wire um, um, slug or a uh, round lug. Um, round lug settings, Verndy does give you torque settings when you read the, the uh, literature that comes with them or you go on their website. So those have tight tor torque settings. Um, and so you may have a call during the exam to know that this table exists in the back of the code book and be able to read this table and understand it and look um, at and apply a torque setting out of this chapter. This is something that's been missing from the code book for a long time, that um, if they give you a slot width, if they give you a, a gauge of the uh, cable, or they tell you it's square millimeter size, any way where you could come back here and look at this tor torque table, uh, you can expect to have to do that in this exam. Um, because this is something everybody's been waiting for and was a big addition to the book that I want to let you know there. Okay, so the manufacturer's literature is either missing or not there. Can't find it online or contact the manufacturer. It, it's um, something that just didn't come with it um, and you need guidance. You now have it through Annex, what number? Annex I. Okay. So those are some really great things coming out in the code book. If you have any questions, you can send us an email. My email, just like uh, all of ours here, it's C R E D S O N at soulpowerpeople.com. Um, and we'll, you're gonna, I see some questions coming here in the chat room uh, dealing with grounding, dealing with Article uh, 705. This is stuff that's going to be covered in Monday night section, um, but, but uh, we session, but we did want to get to you today, yesterday, um, when it comes to verifying the system design and uh, understanding, you know, things that are important to do, choosing the right balance of system and equipment when you're uh, designing and installing the system, 
uh, there's a lot of overlap between content domain areas number one and three, four, five, uh, even six. And so uh, don't be afraid of the code book. Uh, look at what's where and so that you know where things are located and look for cross references. Um, but be familiar, and, and as you're studying from now on, you see a code reference, see something in the, in, the, in the textbook or the dumb up book that deals with codes, um, go to the code book and find it. Read what it says there. Read what it says and what it doesn't say. Read where else it's referenced. If it says to go somewhere, it says, oh, that's, all, that's done in code until Article 690.31. Go to Article 690.31. See what Article 690.31 says and why it relates to what they're talking about somewhere back in Article 240 or Article 300. And get used to flipping back and forth to get to know where these multiple um, references are and where you split hairs as far as which one applies. And for gosh sake, don't forget to look at what part of the chapter you're in to know that you're in the right part that deals with the right thing because the section numbers doesn't include the part number, which is that Roman numeral. You can easily look up the wrong thing. And guess what? NAPSEC will have it on there as one of your choices. Just like I did when I didn't look at part eight on sizing um, that uh, grounding electrode conductor, which dealt with DC current. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. It's 528. We went about a half an hour over, but I hope you got a lot out of this. And um, here for the experience team, it goes more and more uh, as you work through the code book. And um, I will be back to you and look forward to seeing everybody in Monday night session. Okay.